Chapter Eleven of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Hines. Treats of Mr. Fang, the police magistrate, and furnishes a slight specimen of his mode of administering justice. The offence had been committed within the district, and indeed in the immediate neighbourhood of a very notorious metropolitan police office. The crowd had only the satisfaction of accompanying Oliver through two or three streets, and down a place called Mutton Hill, when he was led beneath a low archway and up a dirty court into this dispensary of summary justice by the back way. It was a small paved yard into which they turned, and here they encountered a stout man with a bunch of whiskers on his face and a bunch of keys in his hand. "'What's the matter now?' said the man carelessly. "'A young fogel hunter replied the man who had Oliver in charge. "'Are you the party that's been robbed, sir?' inquired the man with the keys. "'Yes, I am,' replied the old gentleman. "'But I am not sure that this boy actually took the handkerchief. I—I I would rather not press the case.' "'You must go before the magistrate now, sir,' replied the man. "'His worship will be disengaged in half a minute. Now, young gallows.' This was an invitation to Oliver to enter through a door which he unlocked as he spoke, and which led into a stone cell. Here he was searched, and nothing being found upon him locked up. This cell was in size and shape something like an area cellar, only not so light. It was most intolerably dirty, for it was Monday morning, and it had been tenanted by six drunken people who had been locked up elsewhere since Saturday night. But this is little. In our station-houses men and women are every night confined on the most trivial charges, the word is worth noting, in dungeons compared with which those in Newgate, occupied by the most atrocious felons, tried, found guilty, and under sentence of death are palaces. Let anyone who doubts this compare the two. The old gentleman looked almost as rueful as Oliver when the key grated in the lock. He turned with a sigh to the book which had been the innocent cause of all this disturbance. "'There is something in that boy's face,' said the old gentleman to himself as he walked slowly away, tapping his chin with the cover of the book in a thoughtful manner. "'Something that touches and interests me. Can he be innocent? He looked like—by the by,' exclaimed the old gentleman, halting very abruptly and staring up into the sky. Oh, "'Bless my soul! Where have I seen something like that look before?' After musing for some minutes the old gentleman walked with the same meditative face into a back ante-room opening from the yard, and there, retiring into a corner, called up before his mind's eye a vast amphitheatre of faces over which a dusky curtain had hung for many years. No, said the old gentleman, shaking his head, it must be imagination. He wandered over them again. He had called them into view, and it was not easy to replace the shroud that had so long concealed them. There were the faces of friends and foes, and of many that had been almost strangers peering intrusively from the crowd. There were the faces of young and blooming girls that were now old women. There were faces that the grave had changed and closed upon, but which the mind, superior to its power, still dressed in their old freshness and beauty, calling back the lustre of the eyes, the brightness of the smile the beaming of the soul through its mask of clay, and whispering of beauty beyond the tomb, changed but to be heightened, and taken from earth only to be set up as a light, to shed a soft and gentle glow upon the path to heaven. But the old gentleman could recall no one countenance of which Oliver's features bore a trace. So he heaved a sigh over the recollections he awakened, and being happily for himself an absent old gentleman, bury them again in the pages of the musty book. He was roused by a touch on the shoulder, and a request from the man with the keys to follow him into the office. He closed his book hastily, and was at once ushered into the imposing presence of the renowned Mr. Fang. The office was a front parlour with a panelled wall. Mr. Fang sat behind a bar at the upper end, and on one side of the door was a sort of wooden pen in which poor little Oliver was already deposited trembling very much at the awfulness of the scene. Mr. Fang was a lean, long-backed, stiff-necked, middle-sized man, with no great quantity of hair than what he had growing on the back and sides of his head. His face was stern and much flushed. If he were not really in the habit of drinking rather more than was exactly good for him, 
he might have brought an action against his countenance for libel, and have recovered heavy damages. The old gentleman bowed respectfully, and, advancing to the magistrate's desk, said, suiting the action to the word, "'That is my name and address, sir.' He then withdrew a pace or two, and, with another polite and gentlemanly inclination of the head, waited to be questioned. Now it so happened that Mr. Fang was at that moment perusing a leading article in a newspaper of the morning, adverting to some recent decision of his, and commending him for the three hundred and fiftieth time to the special and particular notice of the Secretary of State for the Home Department. He was out of temper, and he looked up with an angry scowl. "'Who are you?' said Mr. Fang. The old gentleman pointed with some surprise to his card. "'Officer!' said Mr. Fang, tossing the card contemptuously away with the newspaper. "'Who is this fellow?' "'My name, sir,' said the old gentleman, speaking like a gentleman. "'My name, sir, is Brownlow. Permit me to inquire the name of the magistrate who offers a gratuitous and unprovoked insult to a respectable person, under the protection of the bench.' Saying this, Mr. Brownlow looked around the office, as if in search of some person who would afford him the required information. "'Officer!' said Mr. Fang, throwing the paper on one side. "'What's this fellow charged with?' "'He's not charged at all, Your Worship,' replied the officer. "'He appears against this boy, Your Worship.' His Worship knew this perfectly well, but it was a good annoyance and a safe one. "'Appears against the boy, does he?' said Mr. Fang, surveying Mr. Brownlow contemptuously from head to foot. "'Swear him.' "'Before I am sworn I must beg to say one word,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'and that is—' that I really never, without actual experience, could have believed—' "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang peremptorily. "'I will not, sir,' replied the old gentleman. "'Hold your tongue this instant, or I'll have you turned out of the office,' said Mr. Fang. "'You are an insolent, impertinent fellow. How dare you bully a magistrate!' "'What?' exclaimed the old gentleman, reddening. "'Swear this person,' said Fang to the clerk. "'I'll not hear another word. Swear him.' Mr. Brownlow's indignation was greatly roused, but reflecting, perhaps, that he might only injure the boy by giving vent to it, he suppressed his feelings and submitted to be sworn at once. "'Now,' said Fang, "'what's the charge against this boy? What have you got to say, sir?' "'I was standing at a bookstall,' Mr. Brownlow began. "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang. "'Policeman! Where's the policeman? Here, swear this policeman. Now, policeman, what is this?' The policeman, with becoming humility, related how he had taken the charge, how he had searched Oliver, and found nothing on his person, and how that was all he knew about it. "'Are there any witnesses?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'None, Your Worship,' replied the policeman. Mr. Fang sat silent for some minutes, and then, turning round to the prosecutor, said in a towering passion, "'Do you mean to state what your complaint against this boy is, man, or do you not?' You have been sworn. Now, if you stand there refusing to give evidence, I'll punish you for disrespect to the bench. I will by—' By what or by whom nobody knows, for the clerk and jailer coughed very loud just at the right moment, and the former dropped a heavy book upon the floor, thus preventing the word from being heard, accidentally, of course. With many interruptions and repeated insults, Mr. Brownlow contrived to state his case observing that in the surprise of the moment he had run after the boy because he had seen him running away, and expressing his hope that if the magistrate should believe him, although not actually the thief, to be connected with the thieves, he would deal as leniently with him as justice would allow. "'He has been hurt already,' said the old gentleman in conclusion. "'And I fear,' he added with great energy, looking towards the bar, "'I really fear that he is ill.' "'Oh, yes, I dare say,' said Mr. Fang, with a sneer. "'Come, none of your tricks here, you young vagabond. They won't do. What's your name?' Oliver tried to reply, but his tongue failed him. He was deadly pale, and the whole place seemed turning round and round. "'What's your name, you hardened scoundrel?' demanded Mr. Fang. "'Officer, what's his name?' This was addressed to a bluff old fellow in a striped waistcoat, who was standing by the bar. He bent over Oliver and repeated the inquiry but finding him really incapable of understanding the question, and knowing that his not replying would only infuriate the magistrate the more, and add to the severity of his sentence, he hazarded a guess. "'He says his name's Tom White, Your Worship,' said the kind-hearted thief-taker. "'No, he won't speak out, won't he?' said Fang. "'Very well, very well. Where does he live?' "'Where he can, Your Worship,' replied the officer, again pretending to receive Oliver's answer. "'Has he any parents?' inquired Mr. Fang. 
"'He says they died in his infancy, Your Worship,' replied the officer, hazarding the usual reply. At this point of the inquiry Oliver raised his head, and looking round with imploring eyes murmured a feeble prayer for a draught of water. "'Stuff and nonsense!' said Mr. Fang. "'Don't try to make a fool of me!' "'I think he really is ill, Your Worship,' remonstrated the officer. "'I know better,' said Mr. Fang. We'll "'Take care of him, officer,' said the old gentleman, raising his hands instinctively. "'He'll fall down.' "'Stand away, officer,' cried Fang. "'Let him if he likes.' Oliver availed himself of the kind permission and fell to the floor in a fainting fit. The men in the office looked at each other, but no one dared to stir. "'I knew he was shamming,' said Fang, as if this were incontestable proof of the fact. "'Let him lie there. He'll soon be tired of that.' "'How do you propose to deal with the case, sir?' inquired the clerk in a low voice. "'Summarily,' replied Mr. Fang. "'He stands committed for three months. Hard labour, of course. Clear the office.' The door was opened for this purpose, and a couple of men were preparing to carry the insensible boy to his cell, when an elderly man of decent but poor appearance, clad in an old suit of black, rushed hastily into the office and advanced towards the bench. "'Stop! Stop! Don't take him away! For heaven's sake, stop a moment!' cried the newcomer, breathless with haste. Although the presiding genii in such an office as this exercise a summary and arbitrary power over the liberties, the good name, the character, almost the lives of Her Majesty's subjects, especially of the poorer class, and although within such walls enough fantastic tricks are daily played to make the angels blind with weeping, they are closed to the public, save through the medium of the daily press, nor were virtually then. Mr. Fang was consequently not a little indignant to see an unbidden guest enter in such irreverent disorder. "'What is this? Who is this? Turn this man out! Clear the office!' cried Mr. Fang. "'I will speak!' cried the man. "'I will not be turned out. I saw it all. I keep the bookstall. I demand to be sworn. I will not be put down. Mr. Fang, you must hear me. You must not refuse, sir.' The man was right. His manner was determined, and the matter was growing rather too serious to be hushed up. "'Swear the man,' growled Mr. Fang, with a very ill grace. "'Now, man, what have you got to say?' "'This,' said the man, "'I saw three boys, two others and the prisoner here, loitering on the opposite side of the way when this gentleman was reading. The robbery was committed by another boy. I saw it done. I saw that this boy was perfectly amazed and stupefied by it.' Having by this time recovered a little breath, the worthy bookstall-keeper proceeded to relate in a more coherent manner the exact circumstances of the robbery. "'Why didn't you come here before?' said Fang, after a pause. "'I hadn't a soul to mind the shop,' replied the man. "'Everybody who could have helped me had joined in the pursuit. I could get nobody till five minutes ago, and I've run here all the way.' "'The prosecutor was reading, was he?' inquired Fang, after another pause. "'Yes,' replied the man. "'The very book he has in his hand.' "'No, that book, eh?' said Fang. "'Is it paid for?' "'No, it is not,' replied the man, with a smile. Oh, "'Dear me, I forgot all about it,' exclaimed the absent old gentleman innocently. "'A nice person to prefer a charge against a poor boy,' said Fang, with a comical effort to look humane. "'I consider, sir, that you have obtained possession of that book under very suspicious and disreputable circumstances, and you may think yourself very fortunate that the owner of the property declines to prosecute.' Let this be a lesson to you, my man, or the law will overtake you yet. The boy is discharged. Clear the office. Damn me! cried the old gentleman, bursting out with the rage he had kept down so long. Oh, damn me, I'll— Clear the office, said the magistrate. Officers, do you hear? Clear the office. The mandate was obeyed, and the indignant Mr. Brownlow was conveyed out with the book in one hand and the bamboo cane in the other, in a perfect frenzy of rage and defiance. He reached the yard, and his passion vanished in a moment. Little Oliver Twist lay on his back on the pavement, with his shirt unbuttoned and his temples bathed with water, his face a deadly white, and a cold tremble convulsing his whole frame. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' said Mr. Brownlow, bending over him. "'Call a coach, somebody, pray, directly!' A coach was obtained, and Oliver, having been carefully laid on the seat, the old gentleman got in and sat himself on the other. "'May I accompany you?' said the bookstall-keeper, looking in. "'Bless me, yes, my dear sir,' said Mr. Brownlow quickly. "'I forgot you. Dear, dear, I have this unhappy book still. Jump in. Poor fellow, there's no time to lose.' The bookstall-keeper got into the coach, and away they drove. End of chapter 11 
Chapter Twelve of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. In which Oliver is taken better care of than he ever was before, and in which the narrator reverts to the merry old gentleman and his youthful friends. The coach rattled away over nearly the same ground as that which Oliver had traversed when he first entered London in company with the Dodger, and, turning a different way when it reached the Angel at Islington, stopped at length before a neat house in a quiet, shady street near Pentonville. Here a bed was prepared, without loss of time, in which Mr. Brownlow saw his young charge carefully and comfortably deposited, and here he was tended with a kindness and solicitude that knew no bounds. But for many days Oliver remained insensible to all the goodness of his new friends. The sun rose and sank and rose and sank again, and many times after that, and still the boy lay stretched on his uneasy bed, dwindling away beneath the dry and wasting heat of fever. The worm does not work more surely on the dead body than does this slow creeping fire upon the living frame. Weak and thin and pallid, he awoke at last from what seemed to have been a long and troubled dream. Feebly raising himself in the bed, with his head resting on his trembling arm, he looked anxiously around. "'What room is this? Where have I been brought to?' said Oliver. "'This is not the place I went to sleep in.' He uttered these words in a feeble voice, being very faint and weak, but they were overheard at once. The curtain at the bed's head was hastily drawn back, and a motherly old lady, very neatly and precisely dressed, rose as she undrew it from an armchair close by, in which she had been sitting at needlework. "'Hush, my dear,' said the old lady softly. "'You must be very quiet, or you will be ill again. And you have been very bad, as bad as bad could be, pity nigh. Lie down again, there's a dear.' With those words the old lady very gently placed Oliver's head upon the pillow, and smoothing back his hair from his forehead looked so kindly and lovingly into his face that he could not help placing his little withered hand in hers and drawing it round his neck. "'Save us,' said the old lady, with tears in her eyes. "'What a grateful little dear it is, pretty creature! What would his mother feel if she sat by him as I have, and could see him now?' "'Perhaps she does see me,' whispered Oliver, folding his hands together. "'Perhaps she has sat by me. I almost feel as if she had.' "'That was the fever, my dear.' said the old lady mildly. "'I suppose it was,' replied Oliver, "'because heaven is a long way off, and they are too happy there to come down to the bedside of a poor boy. But if she knew I was ill she must have pitied me even there, for she was very ill herself before she died. She can't know anything about me, though,' added Oliver after a moment's silence. "'If she had seen me hurt it would have made her sorrowful, and her face has always looked sweet and happy when I have dreamed of her.' The old lady made no reply to this, but wiping her eyes first, and her spectacles which lay on the counterpane afterwards, as if they were part and parcel of those features, brought some cool stuff for Oliver to drink, and then, patting him on the cheek, told him he must lie very quiet or he would be ill again. So Oliver kept very still, partly because he was anxious to obey the kind old lady in all things, and partly, to tell the truth, because he was completely exhausted with what he had already said. He soon fell into a gentle doze, from which he was awakened by the light of a candle, which, being brought near the bed, showed him a gentleman with a very large and loud ticking gold watch in his hand, who felt his pulse and said he was a great deal better. "'You are a great deal better, are you not, my dear?' said the gentleman. "'Yes, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Yes, I know you are,' said the gentleman. "'You're hungry too, aren't you?' "'No, sir,' answered Oliver. Hm, said the gentleman. No, I know you're not. He's not hungry, Mrs. Bedwin, said the gentleman, looking very wise. The old lady made a respectful inclination of the head, which seemed to say that she thought the doctor was a very clever man. The doctor appeared much of the same opinion himself. You feel sleepy, don't you, my dear? said the doctor. No, sir, replied Oliver. No, said the doctor, with a very shrewd and satisfied look. "'You're not sleepy. Not thirsty, are you?' "'Yes, sir, rather thirsty,' answered Oliver. "'Just as I expected, Mrs. Bedwin,' said the doctor. "'It's very natural that he should be thirsty. "'You may give him a little tea, ma'am, and some dry toast without any butter. "'Don't keep him too warm, ma'am, but be careful that you don't let him be too cold. 
Will you have the goodness?' The old lady dropped a curtsey. The doctor, after tasting the cool stuff and expressing a qualified approval of it, hurried away, his boots creaking in a very important and wealthy manner as he went downstairs. Oliver dozed off again soon after this. When he awoke it was nearly twelve o'clock. The old lady tenderly bade him good-night shortly afterwards, and left him in charge of a fat old woman who had just come, bringing with her in a little bundle a small prayer-book and a large nightcap. Putting the latter on her head and the former on the table, the old woman, after telling Oliver that she had come to sit up with him, drew her chair close to the fire, and went off into a series of short naps, checkered at frequent intervals with sundry tumblings forward and diverse moans and chokings. These, however, had no worse effect than causing her to rub her nose very hard, and then fall asleep again. And thus the night crept slowly on. Oliver lay awake for some time, counting the little circles of light which the reflection of the rush-light shade threw upon the ceiling, or tracing with his languid eyes the intricate pattern of the paper on the wall. The darkness and the deep stillness of the room were very solemn, as they brought into the boy's mind the thought that death had been hovering there for many days and nights, and might yet fill it with the gloom and dread of his awful presence. He turned his face upon the pillow and fervently prayed to heaven. Gradually he fell into that deep, tranquil sleep which ease from recent suffering alone imparts, that calm and peaceful rest which it is pain to wake from, who, if this were death, would be roused again to all the struggles and turmoils of life, to all its cares for the present, its anxieties for the future, and, more than all, its weary recollections of the past. It had been bright day for hours when Oliver opened his eyes. He felt cheerful and happy. The crisis of the disease was safely past. He belonged to the world again. In three days' time he was able to sit in an easy chair, well propped up with pillows, and as he was still too weak to walk, Mrs. Bedwin had him carried downstairs into the little housekeeper's room which belonged to her. Having him set here by the fireside, the good old lady sat herself down too, and being in a state of considerable delight at seeing him so much better, forthwith began to cry most violently. "'Never mind me, my dear,' said the old lady. "'I'm only having a regular good cry. There, it's all over now, and I'm quite comfortable.' "'You are very, very kind to me, ma'am,' said Oliver. "'Well, you never mind that, my dear,' said the old lady. "'That's got nothing to do with your broth, and it's full time you had it, for the doctor says Mr. Brownlow may come in to see you this morning, and we must get up our best looks, because the better we look, the more he'll be pleased.' and with this the old lady applied herself to warming up in a little saucepan a basin full of broth, strong enough, Oliver thought, to furnish an ample dinner when reduced to the regulation strength, for three hundred and fifty paupers at the lowest computation. "'Are you fond of pictures, dear?' inquired the old lady, seeing that Oliver had fixed his eyes most intently on a portrait which hung against the wall just opposite his chair. "'I don't quite know, ma'am.' said Oliver, without taking his eyes from the canvas. I have seen so few that I hardly know. What a beautiful, mild face that lady's is! Ah, said the old lady, painters always make ladies out prettier than they are, or they wouldn't get any custom, child. The man that invented the machine for taking likenesses might have known that would never succeed. It's a deal too honest. A deal, said the old lady, laughing very heartily at her own acuteness. Is, is that a likeness, ma'am? said Oliver. Yes, said the old lady, looking up for a moment from the broth. That's a portrait. Whose, ma'am? asked Oliver. Well, really, my dear, I don't know, answered the old lady in a good-humoured manner. It's not a likeness of anybody that you or I know, I expect. It seems to strike your fancy, dear. It is so pretty, replied Oliver. Why, sure you're not afraid of it, said the old lady observing in great surprise the look of awe with which the child regarded the painting. "'Oh, no, no,' returned Oliver quickly, "'but the eyes look so sorrowful, and where I sit they seem fixed upon me. It makes my heart beat,' added Oliver in a low voice, as if it was alive and wanted to speak to me but couldn't. "'Lord save us!' exclaimed the old lady, starting. "'Don't talk in that way, child. You're weak and nervous after your illness. Let me wheel your chair round to the other side, and then you won't see it. There," said the old lady, suiting the action to the word. 
you don't see it now at all events oliver did see it in his mind's eye as distinctly as if he had not altered his position but he thought it better not to worry the kind old lady so he smiled gently when she looked at him and mrs bedwin satisfied that he felt more comfortable salted and broke bits of toasted bread into the broth with all the bustle befitting so solemn a preparation oliver got through it with extraordinary expedition he had scarcely swallowed the last spoonful when there came a soft rap at the door. "'Come in,' said the old lady, and in walked Mr. Brownlow. Now the old gentleman came in as brisk as need be, but he had no sooner raised his spectacles on his forehead and thrust his hands behind the skirts of his dressing-gown to take a good long look at Oliver than his countenance underwent a great variety of odd contortions. Oliver looked very worn and shadowy from sickness and made an ineffectual attempt to stand up out of respect to his benefactor, which terminated in his sinking back into the chair again. And the fact is, if truth must be told, that Mr. Brownlow's heart, being large enough for six ordinary old gentlemen of humane disposition, forced a supply of tears into his eyes by some hydraulic process which we are not sufficiently philosophical to be in a condition to explain. "'Poor boy, poor boy,' said Mr. Brownlow, clearing his throat. I'm rather hoarse this morning, Mrs. Bedwin. I'm afraid I've caught cold. I hope not, sir, said Mrs. Bedwin. Everything you've had has been well aired, sir. I don't know, Bedwin. I don't know, said Mr. Brownlow. I rather think I had a damp napkin at dinner time yesterday. But never mind that. How do you feel, my dear? Very happy, sir, replied Oliver, and very grateful indeed, sir, for your goodness to me. Good boy, said Mr. Brownlow stoutly. Have you given him any nourishment, Bedwin? Any slops, eh? He has just had a basin of beautiful strong broth, sir, replied Mrs. Bedwin, drawing herself up slightly and laying strong emphasis on the last word, to intimate that between slops and broth well compounded there existed no affinity or connection whatsoever. Ugh, said Mr. Brownlow, with a slight shudder. A couple of glasses of port wine would have done him a great deal more good, wouldn't they, Tom White, eh? "'My name is Oliver, sir,' replied the little invalid, with a look of great astonishment. "'Oliver,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Oliver what? Oliver White, eh?' "'No, sir. Twist. Oliver Twist.' "'Queer name,' said the old gentleman. "'What made you tell the magistrate your name was White?' "'I never told him so, sir,' returned Oliver in amazement. This sounded so like a falsehood that the old gentleman looked somewhat sternly in Oliver's face. It was impossible to doubt him. There was truth in every one of his thin and sharpened lineaments. "'Some mistake,' said Mr. Brownlow. But although his motive for looking steadily at Oliver no longer existed, the old idea of the resemblance between his features and some familiar face came upon him so strongly that he could not withdraw his gaze. "'I hope you are not angry with me, sir,' said Oliver, raising his eyes beseechingly. "'No, no,' replied the old gentleman. "'Why, what's this? Bedwin, look there!' As he spoke he pointed hastily to the picture over Oliver's head, and then to the boy's face. There was its living copy. The eyes, the head, the mouth, every feature was the same. The expression was, for the instant, so precisely alike that the minutest line seemed copied with startling accuracy. Oliver knew not the cause of this sudden exclamation, for, not being strong enough to bear the start it gave him, he fainted away. A weakness on his part which affords the narrative an opportunity of relieving the reader from suspense, in behalf of the two young pupils of the merry old gentleman, and of recording that when the dodger and his accomplished friend Master Bates joined in the hue and cry which was raised at Oliver's heels, in consequence of their executing an illegal conveyance of Mr. Brownlow's personal property, as has already been described, they are actuated by a very laudable and becoming regard for themselves. And forasmuch as the freedom of the subject and the liberty of the individual are among the first and proudest boasts of a true-hearted Englishman, so I need hardly beg the reader to observe that this action should tend to exalt them in the opinion of all public and patriotic men in almost as great a degree as this strong proof of their anxiety for their own preservation and safety goes to corroborate and confirm the little code of laws which certain profound and sound judging philosophers have laid down as the main springs of nature's deeds and actions 
the said philosophers very wisely reducing the good lady's proceedings to matters of maxim and theory, and by a very neat and pretty compliment to her exalted wisdom and understanding, putting entirely out of sight any considerations of heart or generous impulse and feeling. For these are matters totally beneath a female who is acknowledged by universal admission to be far above the numerous little foibles and weaknesses of her sex. If I wanted any further proof of the strictly philosophical nature of the conduct of these young gentlemen in their very delicate predicament, I should at once find it in the fact, also recorded in a foregoing part of this narrative, of their quitting the pursuit when the general attention was fixed upon Oliver, and making immediately for their home by the shortest possible cut. Although I do not mean to assert that this is usually the practice of renowned and learned sages, to shorten the road to any great conclusion their course indeed being rather to lengthen the distance, by various circumlocutions and discursive staggerings, like unto those in which drunken men, under the pressure of a too mighty flow of ideas, are prone to indulge. Still, I do mean to say, and do say distinctly, that it is the invariable practice of many mighty philosophers, in carrying out their theories, to evince great wisdom and foresight in providing against every possible contingency which can be supposed at all likely to affect themselves. Thus, to do a great right, you may do a little wrong, and you may take any means which the end to be attained will justify, the amount of the right or the amount of the wrong, or indeed the distinction between the two, being left entirely to the philosopher concerned, to be settled and determined by his clear, comprehensive and impartial view of his own particular case. It was not until the two boys had scoured with great rapidity through a most intricate maze of narrow streets and courts that they ventured to halt beneath a low and dark archway. Having remained silent here just long enough to recover breath to speak, Master Bates uttered an exclamation of amusement and delight, and bursting into an uncontrollable fit of laughter flung himself upon a doorstep and rolled thereon in a transport of mirth. "'What's the matter?' inquired the Dodger. <laughs> <laughs> roared Charlie Bates. "'Oh, your noise!' remonstrated the Dodger, looking cautiously round. "'Do you want to get grabbed, stupid?' "'I can't help it,' said Charlie. "'I can't help it, to see him splitting away at that pace, and cutting round the corners and knocking up again the posts, and starting on again as if he was made of iron as well as them, and me with the wipe in my pocket, singing out after him, oh, my eye!' The vivid imagination of Master Bates presented the scene before him in two strong colours. As he arrived at this apostrophe, he again rolled upon the doorstep and laughed louder than before. "'What will Fagin say?' inquired the Dodger, taking advantage of the next interval of breathlessness on the part of his friend to propound the question. "'What?' repeated Charlie Bates. "'Ah, what?' said the Dodger. "'Why, what should he say?' inquired Charlie, stopping rather suddenly in his merriment, for the Dodger's manner was impressive. "'What should he say?' Mr. Dawkins whistled for a couple of minutes, then, taking off his hat, scratched his head and nodded thrice. "'What do you mean?' said Charlie. "'Tooralaloo, gammon and spinach, the froggy wooden and high cockalurum," said the Dodger, with a slight sneer on his intellectual countenance. This was explanatory, but not satisfactory. Master Bates felt it so, and said again, "'What do you mean?' The Dodger made no reply, but putting his hat on again and gathering the skirts of his long-tailed coat under his arm, thrust his tongue into his cheek, slapped the bridge of his nose some half-dozen times in a familiar but expressive manner, and, turning on his heel, slunk down the court. Master Bates followed, with a thoughtful countenance. The noise of footsteps on the creaking stairs a few minutes after the occurrence of this conversation roused the merry old gentleman as he sat over the fire with a saveloy and a small loaf in his left hand and a pocket-knife in his right and a pewter-pot on the trivet. There was a rascally smile on his white face as he turned round, and looking sharply out from under his thick red eyebrows, bent his ear towards the door and listened. "'Why, how's this?' muttered the Jew, changing countenance. "'Only two of them. Where's the third? They can't have got into trouble. Bark. The footsteps approached nearer. They reached the landing. The door was slowly opened, and the Dodger and Charlie Bates entered, closing it behind them. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Tyg Hines. Some new acquaintances are introduced to the intelligent reader, connected with whom various pleasant matters are related appertaining to this history. Where's Oliver? said the Jew, rising with a menacing look. Where's the boy? The young thieves eyed their preceptor as if they were alarmed at his violence, and looked uneasily at each other, but they made no reply. "'What's become of the boy?' said the Jew, seizing the dodger tightly by the collar, and threatening him with horrid imprecations. "'Speak out, or I'll throttle you!' Mr. Fagin looked so very much in earnest that Charlie Bates, who deemed it prudent in all cases to be on the safe side, and who conceived it by no means improbable that it might be his turn to be throttled second, dropped upon his knees and raised a loud, well-sustained and continuous roar, something between a mad bull and a speaking-trumpet. "'Will you speak?' thundered the Jew, shaking the dodger so much that his keeping in the big coat at all seemed perfectly miraculous. "'Why, the traps have got him, and that's all about it,' said the dodger sullenly. "'Come, let go of me, will you?' And swinging himself at one jerk clean out of the big coat, which he left in the Jew's hands, the dodger snatched up the toasting-fork and made a pass at the merry old gentleman's waistcoat, which, if it had taken effect, would have let a little more merriment out than could have been easily replaced. The Jew stepped back in this emergency with more agility than could have been anticipated in a man of his apparent decrepitude, and seizing up the pot prepared to hurl it at his assailant's head. But Charlie Bates at this moment, calling his attention by a perfectly terrific howl, he suddenly altered its destination, and flung it full at that young gentleman. "'Why, what the blazes is in the wind now?' growled a deep voice. "'Who pitched that ear at me? It's well as the beer and not the pot as hit me, or I'd have set with somebody. I might have knowed as nobody but an infernal rich, plundering, thundering old Jew could afford to throw away any drink but water.' and not that unless he'd done the river company every quarter what's it all about fagin damn me if my neck handkerchief ain't lined with beer come in you sneakin warmint what are you stopping outside for as if you was ashamed of your master come in the man who growled out these words was a stoutly built fellow of about five and thirty in a black velveteen coat very soiled drab breeches lace-up half-boots and grey cotton stockings which enclosed a bulky pair of legs, with large swelling calves, the kind of legs which in such costume always look in an unfinished and incomplete state without a set of fetters to garnish them. He had a brown hat on his head, and a dirty belcher handkerchief round his neck, with the long frayed ends of which he smeared the beer from his face as he spoke. He disclosed, when he had done so, a broad heavy countenance, with a beard of three days' growth and two scowling eyes, one of which displayed various particular symptoms, of having been recently damaged by a blow. "'Come in, dear here,' growled this engaging ruffian. A white shaggy dog with his face scratched and torn in twenty different places skulked into the room. "'Why didn't you come in afore?' said the man. "'You're getting too proud to owe me afore company, are you? Lie down!' This command was accompanied with a kick which sent the animal to the other end of the room. He appeared well used to it, however, for he coiled himself up in a corner very quietly, without uttering a sound, and winking his very ill-looking eyes twenty times a minute, appeared to occupy himself in taking a survey of the apartment. "'What are you up to? You're treating the boys, you covetous, avaricious, insatiable old fence,' said the man, seating himself deliberately. "'I wonder they don't murder you.' I would if I was them. If I'd been your apprentice I'd have done it long ago. And now I couldn't have sold you afterwards for your fit for nothing but keeping as a curiosity of ugliness in a glass bottle. And I suppose they don't blow glass bottles large enough. Hush, hush, Mr. Sykes, said the Jew, trembling. Don't speak so loud. None of your mistering, replied the ruffian. You've always made mischief when you come to that. You know my name. Out with it. I shan't disgrace it when the time comes. "'Well, well then, Bill Sykes,' said the Jew, with abject humility. "'You seem out of humour, Bill.' "'Perhaps I am,' replied Sykes. "'I should think you was rather out of sorts, too, unless you mean as little arm when you throw pewter pots about, as you do when you blab and—' "'Are you mad?' said the Jew, catching the man by the sleeve and pointing towards the boys. Mr. Sykes contented himself with tying an imaginary knot under his left ear, and jerking his head over on the right shoulder— a piece of dumb show which the Jew appeared to understand perfectly. 
he then in cant terms with which his whole conversation was plentifully besprinkled but which would be quite unintelligible if they were recorded here demanded a glass of liquor now mind you don't poison it said mr sykes laying his hat upon the table this was said in jest but if the speaker could have seen the evil leer with which the jew bit his pale lip as he turned round to the cupboard he might have thought the caution not wholly unnecessary or the wish at all events to improve upon the distiller's ingenuity not very far from the old gentleman's merry heart after swallowing two or three glasses of spirits mr sykes condescended to take some notice of the young gentleman which gracious act led to a conversation in which the cause and manner of oliver's capture were circumstantially detailed with such alterations and improvements on the truth as to the dodger appeared most advisable under the circumstances i'm afraid said the jew that he may say something which will get us into trouble that's very likely returned sykes with a malicious grin you're blowed upon fagin and i'm afraid you see added the jew speaking as if he had not noticed the interruption and regarding the other closely as he did so i'm afraid that if the game was up with us it might be up with a good many more and that it would come out rather worse for you than it would for me my dear the man started and turned round upon the jew but the old gentleman's shoulders were shrugged up to his ears and his eyes were vacantly staring on the opposite wall there was a long pause every member of the respectable coterie appeared plunged in his own reflections not excepting the dog who by a certain malicious licking of his lips seemed to be meditating an attack upon the legs of the first gentleman or lady he might encounter in the streets when he went out somebody must find out what's been done at the office said mr sykes in a much lower tone than he had taken since he came in the jew nodded assent if he has impeached and is committed there's no fear till he comes out again said mr sykes and then he must be taken care on you must get hold of him somehow again the jew nodded the prudence of this line of action indeed was obvious but unfortunately there was one very strong objection to its being adopted this was that the dodger and charlie bates and fagin and mr william sykes happened one and all to entertain a violent and deeply rooted antipathy to going near a police office on any ground or pretext whatever how long they might have sat and looked at each other in a state of uncertainty not the most pleasant of its kind it is difficult to guess it is not necessary to make any guesses on the subject however for the sudden entrance of the two young ladies whom oliver had seen on a former occasion caused the conversation to flow afresh the very thing said the jew bet will go won't you my dear where's inquired the young lady only just up to the office my dear said the jew coaxingly it is due to the young lady to say that she did not positively affirm that she would not but that she merely expressed an emphatic and earnest desire to be blessed if she would a polite and delicate evasion of the request which shows the young lady to have been possessed of that natural good breeding which cannot bear to inflict upon a fellow-creature the pain of a direct and pointed refusal the jew's countenance fell he turned from this young lady who was gaily not to say gorgeously attired in a red gown green boots and yellow curl papers to the other female nancy my dear said the jew in a soothing manner what do you say that i won't do so it's no use to try it on fagin replied nancy what do you mean by that said mr sykes looking up in a surly manner what i say bill replied the lady collectedly well you're just the very person for it reasoned mr sykes nobody about here knows anything of you and as i don't want him to neither replied nancy in the same composed manner it's rather more no than yes with me bill she'll go fagin said sykes no she won't fagin said nancy yes she will fagin said sykes and mr sykes was right by dint of alternate threats promises and bribes the lady in question was ultimately prevailed upon to undertake the commission she was not indeed withheld by the same considerations as her agreeable friend for having recently removed into the neighbourhood of field lane from the remote but genteel suburb of ratcliffe she was not under the same apprehension of being recognised by any of her numerous acquaintances accordingly with a clean white apron tied over her gown and her curl papers tucked up under a straw bonnet both articles of dress being provided from the jew's inexhaustible stock miss nancy prepared to issue forth on her errand stop a minute my dear said the jew producing a little covered basket carry that in one hand 
It looks more respectable, my dear. Give it a door key to carry into the one fagin, said Sykes. It looks real and genuine like. Yes, yes, my dear, so it does, said the Jew, hanging a large street door key on the forefinger of the young lady's right hand. There, very good, very good indeed, my dear, said the Jew, rubbing his hands. How, my brother, my poor, dear, sweet, innocent little brother, exclaimed Nancy, bursting into tears, and wringing the little basket and the street door key in an agony of distress. What's become of them? Where have they taken him to? Oh, do have pity and tell me what's been done with the dear boy, gentlemen. Do, gentlemen, if you please, gentlemen. Having uttered those words in a most lamentable and heartbroken tone, to the immeasurable delight of our hearers, Miss Nancy paused, winked to the company, nodded smilingly round, and disappeared. "'Ah, she's a clever girl, my dears,' said the Jew, turning round to his young friends, and shaking his head gravely, as if in mute admonition to them to follow the bright example they had just beheld. "'She's an honour to her sex, said Mr. Sykes, filling his glass, and smiting the table with his enormous fist. "'Is her elf, and wishing they was all like her.' While these and many other encomiums were being passed on the accomplished Nancy, that young lady made the best of her way to the police office, whither, notwithstanding a little natural timidity, consequent upon walking through the streets alone and unprotected, she arrived in perfect safety shortly afterwards. Entering by the back way, she tapped softly with the key at one of the cell doors and listened. There was no sound within, so she coughed and listened again. Still there was no reply, so she spoke. "'Nolly, dear,' murmured Nancy in a gentle voice. "'Nolly!' There was nobody inside but a miserable, shoeless criminal, who had been taken up for playing the flute, and who, the offence against society having been clearly proved, had been very properly committed by Mr. Fang to the House of Correction for one month, with the appropriate and amusing remark that since he had so much breath to spare, it would be more wholesomely expended on the treadmill than in a musical instrument. He made no answer, being occupied mentally bewailing the loss of the flute, which had been confiscated for the use of the county. So Nancy passed on to the next cell and knocked there. "'Well?' cried a faint and feeble voice. "'Is there a little boy here?' inquired Nancy with a preliminary sob. "'No,' replied the voice. "'God forbid!' This was a vagrant of sixty-five who was going to prison for not playing the flute, or, in other words, for begging in the streets and doing nothing for his livelihood. In the next cell was another man, who was going to the same prison for hawking tin saucepans without licence, thereby doing something for his living in defiance of the stamp office. But as neither of these criminals answered to the name of Oliver or knew anything about him, Nancy made straight up to the bluff officer in the striped waistcoat, and with the most piteous wailings and lamentations rendered more piteous by a prompt and efficient use of the street-door key and the little basket, demanded her own dear brother. "'I haven't got him, my dear,' said the old man. "'Where is he?' screamed Nancy in a distracted manner. "'Why, the gentleman's got him,' replied the officer. "'What gentleman? Oh, gracious heavens, what gentleman?' exclaimed Nancy. In reply to this incoherent questioning, the old man informed the deeply affected sister that Oliver had been taken ill in the office, and discharged in consequence of a witness having proved the robbery to have been committed by another boy not in custody, and that the prosecutor had carried him away in an insensible condition to his own residence, of and concerning which all the informant knew was that it was somewhere in Pentonville, he having heard the word mentioned in the directions to the coachman. In a dreadful state of doubt and uncertainty the agonised young woman staggered to the gate, and then, exchanging her faltering walk for a swift run, returned by the most devious and complicated route she could think of to the domicile of the Jew. Mr. Bill Sykes no sooner heard the account of the expedition delivered than he very hastily called up the white dog and, putting on his hat, expeditiously departed, without devoting any time to the formality of wishing the company good morning. "'We must know where he is, my dears. He must be found,' said the Jew, greatly excited. "'Charlie, do nothing but skulk about till you bring home some news of him. "'Nancy, my dear, I must have him found. "'I trust to you, my dear, and to you and the awful dodger for everything. "'Stay, stay,' added the Jew, unlocking the drawer with a shaking hand. "'There's money, my dears. I shall shut up this shop to-night. "'You'll know where to find me. "'Don't stop here a minute, not an instant, my dears.' 
With these words he pushed them from the room, and carefully double-locking and barring the door behind them, drew from its place of concealment the box which he had unintentionally disclosed to Oliver. Then he hastily proceeded to dispose of the watches and jewellery beneath his clothing. A rap at the door startled him in his occupation. "'Who's there?' he cried in a shrill tone. "'Me,' replied the voice of the dodger through the keyhole. "'What now?' cried the Jew impatiently. "'Is you to be kidnapped to the other ken, Nancy says?' inquired the dodger. "'Yes,' replied the Jew, "'wherever she lays hands on him. Find him, find him out, that's all. I shall know what to do next, never fear.' The boy murmured a reply of intelligence, and hurried downstairs after his companions. "'He is not Pete so far,' said the Jew, as he pursued his occupation. "'If he means to blab us among his new friends, we may stop his mouth yet.' End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines Comprising further particulars of Oliver's stay at Mr. Brownlow's, with a remarkable prediction which one Mr. Grimwig uttered concerning him, when he went out on an errand. Oliver, soon recovering from the fainting fit into which Mr. Brownlow's abrupt exclamation had thrown him, the subject of the picture was carefully avoided, both by the old gentleman and Mrs. Bedwin, in the conversation that ensued, which indeed bore no reference to Oliver's history or prospects, but was confined to such topics as might amuse without exciting him. He was still too weak to get up to breakfast, but when he came down into the housekeeper's room next day, his first act was to cast an eager glance at the wall, in the hope of again looking on the face of the beautiful lady. His expectations were disappointed, however, for the picture had been removed. Ah, said the housekeeper, watching the direction of Oliver's eyes, it is gone, you see. I see it is, ma'am, replied Oliver. Why have they taken it away? It has been taken down, child, because Mr. Brownlow said that as it seemed to worry you, perhaps it might prevent you getting well, you know, rejoined the old lady. Oh, no, indeed. It didn't worry me, ma'am, said Oliver. I like to see it. I quite loved it." "'Well, well,' said the old lady good-humouredly, "'you get well as fast as ever you can, dear, and it shall be hung up again. There, I promise you that. Now let us talk about something else.' This was all the information Oliver could obtain about the picture at that time. As the old lady had been so kind to him in his illness, he endeavoured to think no more of the subject just then. So he listened attentively to a great many stories she told him, about an amiable and handsome daughter of hers, who was married to an amiable and handsome man and lived in the country, and about a son who was a clerk to a merchant in the West Indies, and who was also such a good young man and wrote such dutiful letters home four times a year, that it brought tears into her eyes to talk about them. When the old lady had expatiated a long time on the excellences of her children, and the merits of her kind good husband besides, who had been dead and gone, poor dear soul, just six and twenty years, it was time to have tea. After tea she began to teach Oliver cribbage, which he learnt as quickly as she could teach, and at which game they played with great interest and gravity, until it was time for the invalid to have some warm wine and water with a slice of dry toast, and then to go cosily to bed. They were happy days, those of Oliver's recovery. Everything was so quiet and neat and orderly, everybody so kind and gentle, that after the noise and turbulence in the midst of which he had always lived, it seemed like heaven itself. He was no sooner strong enough to put his clothes on properly than Mr. Brownlow caused a complete new suit and a new cap and a new pair of shoes to be provided for him. As Oliver was told that he might do what he liked with the old clothes, he gave them to a servant who had been very kind to him, and asked her to sell them to a Jew, and keep the money for herself. This she very readily did, and as Oliver looked out of the parlour window and saw the Jew roll them up in his bag and walk away, he felt quite delighted to think that they were safely gone, and that there was now no possible danger of his ever being able to wear them again. They were sad rags, to tell the truth and Oliver had never had a new suit before. One evening, about a week after the affair of the picture, as he was sitting talking to Mrs. Bedwin, there came a message down from Mr. Brownlow, that if Oliver Twist felt pretty well he would like to see him in his study, and talk to him a little while. "'Bless us and save us! 
"'Wash your hands and let me part your hair nicely for you, child,' said Mrs. Bedwin. "'Dear heart alive, if we had known he would have asked for you, we would have put you in a clean collar and made you as smart as sixpence.' Oliver did as the old lady bade him, and although she lamented grievously meanwhile that there was not even time to crimp the little frill that bordered his shirt-collar, he looked so delicate and handsome despite that important personal advantage, that she went so far as to say, looking at him with great complacency from head to foot, that she really didn't think it would have been possible on the longest notice to have made much difference in him for the better. Thus encouraged, Oliver tapped at the study door. On Mr. Brownlow calling him to come in, he found himself in a little back room, quite full of books, with a window looking into some pleasant little gardens. There was a table drawn up before the window at which Mr. Brownlow was seated reading. When he saw Oliver he pushed the book away from him and told him to come near the table and sit down. Oliver complied, marvelling where the people could be found to read such a great number of books as seemed to be written to make the world wiser, which is still a marvel to more experienced people than Oliver Twist every day of their lives. "'There are a great many books, are there not, my boy?' said Mr. Brownlow, observing the curiosity with which Oliver surveyed the shelves that reached from the floor to the ceiling. "'A great number, sir,' replied Oliver. "'I never saw so many.' But "'You shall read them if you behave well,' said the old gentleman kindly. "'And you will like that better than looking at the outsides, that is, in some cases, because there are books of which the backs and covers are by far the best parts.' "'I suppose they are those heavy ones, sir.' said Oliver, pointing to some large quartos, with a good deal of gilding about the binding. "'Not always those,' said the old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head and smiling as he did so. "'There are other equally heavy ones, though of a much smaller size. How would you like to grow up a clever man and write books, eh?' "'I think I would rather read them, sir,' replied Oliver. "'What? Wouldn't you like to be a book-writer?' said the old gentleman. Oliver considered a little while, and at last said he should think it would be a much better thing to be a bookseller, upon which the old gentleman laughed heartily, and declared he had said a very good thing, which Oliver felt glad to have done, though he by no means knew what it was. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman, composing his features, "'don't be afraid. We won't make an author of you while there's an honest trade to be learnt, nor brick-making to turn to.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Oliver. At the earnest manner of his reply the old gentleman laughed again, and said something about a curious instinct which Oliver, not understanding, paid no very great attention to. "'Now,' said Mr. Brownlow, speaking, if possible, in a kinder, but at the same time in a much more serious manner than Oliver had ever known him assume yet, "'I want you to pay great attention, my boy, to what I am going to say. I shall talk to you without any reserve, because I am sure you are well able to understand me, as many older persons would be. "'Oh, don't tell me you are going to send me away, sir, pray!' exclaimed Oliver, alarmed at the serious tone of the old gentleman's commencement. "'Don't turn me out of doors to wander the streets again. Let me stay here and be a servant. Don't send me back to the wretched place I came from. Have mercy upon a poor boy, sir!' "'My dear child,' said the old gentleman, moved by the warmth of Oliver's sudden appeal, "'you need not be afraid of my deserting you, unless you give me cause.' "'I never, never will, sir!' interposed Oliver. "'I hope not,' rejoined the old gentleman. "'I do not think you ever will. I have been deceived before in the objects whom I have endeavoured to benefit, but I feel strongly disposed to trust you nevertheless. And I am more interested in your behalf than I can well account for even to myself. The persons on whom I have bestowed my dearest love lie deep in their graves, but although the happiness and delight of my life lie buried there too, I have not made a coffin of my heart and sealed it up for ever on my best affections. Deep affliction has but strengthened and refined them." As the old gentleman said this in a low voice, more to himself than to his companion, and as he remained silent for a short time afterwards, Oliver sat quite still. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman at length, in a more cheerful tone, "'I only say this because you have a young heart and knowing that I have suffered great pain and sorrow, you will be more careful, perhaps, not to wound me again. You say you are an orphan, without a friend in the world. All the inquiries I have been able to make confirm the statement. Let me hear your story, where you came from, who brought you up, and how you got into the company in which I found you. Speak the truth, and you shall not be friendless while I live." Oliver's sobs checked his utterance for some minutes. 
when he was on the point of beginning to relate how he had been brought up at the farm and carried to the workhouse by Mr. Bumble, a peculiarly impatient little double knock was heard at the street door, and the servant, running upstairs, announced Mr. Grimwig. "'Is he coming up?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'Yes, sir,' replied the servant. "'He asked if there were any muffins in the house, and, when I told him yes, he said he had come to tea.' Mr. Brownlow smiled, and, turning to Oliver, said that Mr. Grimwig was an old friend of his, and he must not mind his being a little rough in his manners, for he was a worthy creature at bottom, as he had reason to know. "'Shall I go downstairs, sir?' inquired Oliver. "'No,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'I would rather you remained here.' At this moment there walked into the room, supporting himself by a thick stick, a stout old gentleman, rather lame in one leg, who was dressed in a blue coat, striped waistcoat, nankeen breeches and gaiters, and a broad-brimmed white hat with the sides turned up with green. A very small plaited shirt-frill stuck out from his waistcoat, and a very long steel watch-chain with nothing but a key at the end dangled loosely below it. The ends of his white neckerchief were twisted into a ball about the size of an orange. The variety of shapes into which his countenance was twisted defied description. He had a manner of screwing his head on one side when he spoke, and of looking out of the corners of his eyes at the same time, which irresistibly reminded the beholder of a parrot. In this attitude he fixed himself the moment he made his appearance, and, holding out a small piece of orange peel at arm's length, exclaimed in a growling, discontented voice, "'Look here! Do you see this? Isn't it a most wonderful and extraordinary thing that I can't call it a man's house, but I find a piece of this poor surgeon's friend on the staircase? I've been lamed at orange peel once, and I know orange peel will be my death, or I'll be content to eat my own head, sir." This was the handsome offer with which Mr. Grimwig backed and confirmed nearly every assertion he made, and it was the more singular in his case because even admitting for the sake of argument the possibility of scientific improvements being brought to that pass which will enable a gentleman to eat his own head in the event of his being so disposed mr grimwig's head was such a particularly large one that the most sanguine man alive could hardly entertain a hope of being able to get through it at a sitting to put entirely out of the question a very thick coating of powder i'll eat my head sir repeated mr grimwig striking his stick upon the ground "'Hello! What's that?' looking at Oliver and retreating a pace or two. "'This is young Oliver Twist, whom we were speaking about,' said Mr. Brownlow. Oliver bowed. "'You don't mean to say that's the boy who had the fever, I hope?' said Mr. Grimwig, recoiling a little more. "'Wait a minute! Don't speak! Stop!' continued Mr. Grimwig abruptly, losing all dread of the fever in his triumph at the discovery. "'That's the boy who had the orange. If that's not the boy who had the orange and threw this bit of peel upon the staircase, I'll eat my head. And his too.' "'No, no, he has not had one,' said Mr. Brownlow, laughing. "'Come, put down your hat and speak to my young friend.' "'I feel strongly on the subject, sir,' said the irritable old gentleman, drawing off his gloves. "'There's always more or less orange peel on the pavement in our street, and I know it's put there by the surgeon's boy at the corner.' A young woman stumbled over a bit last night and fell against my garden railings. Directly she got up I saw her look towards his infernal red lamp with the pantomime light. "'Don't go to him!' I called out of the window. "'He's an assassin, a man-trap. "'So he is, if he's not.' Here the irascible old gentleman gave a great knock on the ground with a stick, which is always understood by his friends to imply the customary offer, whenever it was not expressed in words. Then, still keeping his stick in his hand, he sat down, and opening a double eyeglass which he wore attached to a broad black riband, took a view of Oliver, who, seeing that he was the object of inspection, coloured and bowed again. "'That's the boy, is it?' said Mr. Grimwig at length. "'That's the boy,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'How are you, boy?' said Mr. Grimwig. "'A great deal better, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. Mr. Brownlow, seeming to apprehend that his singular friend was about to say something disagreeable, asked Oliver to step downstairs and tell Mrs. Bedwin they were ready for tea, which, as he did not half like the visitor's manner, he was very happy to do. "'He's a nice-looking boy, is he not?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'I don't know,' replied Mr. Grimwick pettishly. "'Don't know?' "'No, I don't know. I never see any difference in boys.' 
I only knew two sorts of boys, mealy boys and beef-faced boys. And which is Oliver? Mealy. I know a friend who has a beef-faced boy, a fine boy they call him, with a round head and red cheeks and glaring eyes, a horrid boy, with a body and limbs that appear to be swelling out of the seams of his blue clothes, with the voice of a pilot and the appetite of a wolf. I know him, the wretch. Come, said Mr. Brownlow, these are not the characteristics of young Oliver Twist, so he needn't excite your wrath. They are not, replied Mr. Grimwig. He may have worse. Here Mr. Brownlow coughed impatiently, which appeared to afford Mr. Grimwig the most exquisite delight. "'He may have worse, I say,' repeated Mr. Grimwig. "'Where does he come from? Who is he? What is he? He has had a fever. What of that? Fevers are not particular to good people, are they? Bad people have fevers sometimes, haven't they, eh? I knew a man who was hung in Jamaica for murdering his master. He had had a fever six times. He wasn't recommended to mercy on that account. Phew! Nonsense!' Now the fact was that in the inmost recesses of his own heart Mr. Grimwig was strongly disposed to admit that Oliver's appearance and manner were unusually prepossessing. But he had a strong appetite for contradiction, sharpened on this occasion by the finding of the orange-peel, and inwardly determining that no man should dictate to him whether a boy was well-looking or not, he had resolved from the first to oppose his friend. When Mr. Brownlow admitted that no one point of inquiry could yet return a satisfactory answer, and that he had postponed any investigation into Oliver's previous history until he thought the boy was strong enough to hear it, Mr. Grimwig chuckled maliciously, and he demanded with a sneer whether the housekeeper was in the habit of counting the plate at night, because if she didn't find a tablespoon or two missing some sunshiny morning, why, he would be content to, and so forth. All this Mr. Brownlow, though himself somewhat of an impetuous gentleman, knowing his friend's peculiarities, bore with great good humour. As Mr. Grimwig at tea was graciously pleased to express his entire approval of the muffins, matters went on very smoothly, and Oliver, who made one of the party, began to feel more at ease than he had yet done in the fierce old gentleman's presence. "'And when are you going to hear a full, true, and particular account of the life and adventures of Oliver Twist?' asked Mr. Grimwick of Mr. Brownlow at the conclusion of the meal, looking sideways at Oliver as he resumed his subject. "'Tomorrow morning,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'I would rather he was alone with me at the time. Come up to me tomorrow morning at ten o'clock, my dear.' "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. He answered with some hesitation, because he was confused by Mr. Grimwig's looking so hard at him. "'I'll tell you what,' whispered that gentleman to Mr. Brownlow. "'He won't come up to you to-morrow morning. I saw him hesitate. He's deceiving you, my good friend.' "'I'll swear he is not,' replied Mr. Brownlow warmly. "'If he is not,' said Mr. Grimwig, "'I'll—' and down went the stick. "'I'll answer for that boy's truth with my life,' said Mr. Brownlow, knocking the table. "'And I for his falsehood with my head,' rejoined Mr. Grimwig, knocking the table also. "'We shall see,' said Mr. Brownlow checking his rising anger. "'We will,' replied Mr. Grimwig, with a provoking smile. "'We will.' As fate would have it, Mrs. Bedwin chanced to bring in at this moment a small parcel of books, which Mr. Brownlow had that morning purchased of the identical bookstall-keeper, who was already figured in this history. Having laid them on the table, she prepared to leave the room. "'Stop the boy, Mrs. Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'There is something to go back.' "'He is gone, sir.' replied Mrs. Bedwin. "'Call after him,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'It's particular. He's a poor man, and they're not paid for. There are some books to be taken back to.' The street door was opened. Oliver ran one way, and the girl ran another, and Mrs. Bedwin stood on the step and screamed for the boy. But there was no boy in sight. Oliver and the girl returned, in a breathless state, to report that there was no tidings of him. "'Dear me, I am very sorry for that.' exclaimed Mr. Brownlow. I particularly wish those books to be returned to-night. "'Send Oliver with them,' said Mr. Grimwig, with an ironical smile. "'He will be sure to deliver them safely, you know.' "'Yes, do let me take them, if you please, sir,' said Oliver. "'I'll run all the way, sir.' The old gentleman was just going to say that Oliver should not go out on any account, when a most malicious cough from Mr. Grimwig determined him that he should, and that, by his prompt discharge of the commission, he should prove to him the injustice of his suspicions, on this head at least, at once. "'You shall go, my dear,' said the old gentleman. "'The books are on a chair by my table. Fetch them down.' 
Oliver, delighted to be of use, brought down the books under his arm in a great bustle, and waited, cap in hand, to hear what message he was to take. "'You are to say,' said Mr. Brownlow, glancing steadily at Grimwig, "'you are to say that you have brought those books back, and that you have come to pay the four pound ten I owe him. This is a five pound note, so you will have to bring back ten shillings change.' "'I won't be ten minutes, sir,' said Oliver eagerly having buttoned up the bank-note in his jacket-pocket and placed the books carefully under his arm he made a respectful bow and left the room mrs bedwin followed him to the street door giving him many directions about the nearest way and the name of the bookseller and the name of the street all of which oliver said he clearly understood having superadded many injunctions to be sure not to take cold the old lady at length permitted him to depart bless his sweet face said the old lady, looking after him. I can't bear somehow to let him go out of my sight. At this moment Oliver looked gaily round, and nodded before he turned the corner. The old lady smilingly returned his salutation, and, closing the door, went back to her own room. "'Let me see. He'll be back in twenty minutes at the longest,' said Mr. Brownlow, pulling out his watch and placing it on the table. "'It will be dark by that time.' "'Oh, you really expect him to come back, do you?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. "'Don't you?' asked Mr. Brownlow, smiling. The spirit of contradiction was strong in Mr. Grimwig's breast at the moment, and it was rendered stronger by his friend's confident smile. "'No,' he said, smiting the table with his fist, "'I do not. The boy has a new suit of clothes on his back, and a set of valuable books under his arm, and a five-pound note in his pocket. He'll join his old friends the thieves and laugh at you.' If ever that boy returns to this house, sir, I'll eat my head." With these words he drew his chair closer to the table, and there the two friends sat in silent expectation, the watch between them. It is worthy to remark, as illustrating the importance we attach to our own judgments, and the pride with which we put forth our most rash and hasty conclusions, that although Mr. Grimwig was not by any means a bad-hearted man, and though he would have been unfeignedly sorry to see his respected friend duped and deceived, he really did most earnestly and strongly hope at that moment that Oliver Twist might not come back. It grew so dark that the figures on the dial-plate were scarcely discernible. But there the two old gentlemen continued to sit in silence with the watch between them. End of chapter fourteen. Chapter fifteen of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tige Hines. Showing how very fond of Oliver Twist the merry old Jew and Miss Nancy were. In the obscure parlour of a low public house in the filthiest part of Little Saffron Hill, a dark and gloomy den where a flaring gaslight burnt all day in the winter time, and where no ray of sun ever shone in the summer, there sat, brooding over a little pewter measure and a small glass, strongly impregnated with the smell of liquor, a man in a velveteen coat, drab shorts, half-boots and stockings whom even by that dim light no experienced agent of the police would have hesitated to recognize as Mr. William Sykes. At his feet sat a white-coated, red-eyed dog, who occupied himself alternately in winking at his master with both eyes at the same time, and licking a large, fresh cut on one side of his mouth, which appeared to be the result of some recent conflict. "'Keep quiet, you warmint! Keep quiet!' said Mr. Sykes, suddenly breaking silence. Whether his meditations were so intense as to be disturbed by the dog's winking, or whether his feelings were so wrought upon by his reflections that they required all the relief derivable from kicking an unoffending animal to allay them, is matter for argument and consideration. Whatever was the cause, the effect was a kick and a curse, bestowed upon the dog simultaneously. Dogs are not generally apt to revenge injuries inflicted upon them by their masters, but Mr. Sykes' dog, having faults of temper in common with his owner, and labouring perhaps at this moment under a powerful sense of injury, made no more ado but at once fixed his teeth into one of the half-boots. Having given it a hearty shake he retired growling under a form, just escaping the pewter measure which Mr. Sykes levelled at his head. "'You would, would you?' said Sykes, seizing the poker in one hand, and deliberately opening with the other a large clasp-knife, which he drew from his pocket. "'Come here, you bone-devil! Come here! Do you hear?' 
The dog no doubt heard, because Mr. Sykes spoke in the very harshest key of a very harsh voice. But appearing to entertain some unaccountable objection to having his throat cut, he remained where he was, and growled more fiercely than before, at the same time grasping the end of the poker between his teeth and biting at it like a wild beast. This resistance only infuriated Mr. Sykes the more, who, dropping on his knees, began to assail the animal most furiously. The dog jumped from right to left and from left to right, snapping, growling, and barking. The man thrust and swore and struck and blasphemed, and the struggle was reaching a most critical point for one or other, when the door suddenly opening the dog darted out, leaving Bill Sykes with the poker and the clasp-knife in his hands. There must always be two parties to a quarrel, says the old adage. Mr. Sykes, being disappointed of the dog's participation, at once transferred his share of the quarrel to the newcomer. "'What the devil do you come in between me and my dog for?' said Sykes, with a fierce gesture. "'I didn't know, my dear, I didn't know,' replied Fagin humbly, for the Jew was a newcomer. "'Didn't know, you white-livered thief,' growled Sykes. "'Couldn't you hear the noise?' "'Not a sound of it, as I'm a living man, Bill,' replied the Jew. "'Oh, no, you hear nothing, you don't,' retorted Sykes, with a fierce sneer. "'Sneaking in and out, so as nobody hears how you come or go. I wish you had been the dog Fagin half a minute ago.' "'Why?' inquired the Jew, with a forced smile. "'Cause the government has cares for the lives of such men as you, as haven't half the pluck of curs. Let's a man kill a dog how he likes replied Sykes, shutting up the knife with a very expressive look. That's why. The Jew rubbed his hands, and sitting down at the table affected to laugh at the pleasantry of his friend. He was obviously very ill at ease, however. "'Grin away,' said Sykes, replacing the poker, and surveying him with savage contempt. "'Grin away. You'll never have the laugh at me, though, unless it's behind a nightcap. I've got the upper hand over you, Fagin, and damn me, I'll keep it. There, if I go, you go, so take care of me. Well, well, my dear, said the Jew, I know all that. We, we have a mutual interest, Bill, a mutual interest. Huh, said Sykes, as if he thought the interest lay rather more on the Jew's side than on his. Well, what have you got to say to me? It's all past safe through the melting pot replied Fagin. And this is your share. It's rather more than it ought to be, my dear. But as I know you'll do me a good turn another time, and— Stow that gammon, interposed the robber impatiently. Where is it? And over. Yes, yes, Bill. Give me time, give me time, replied the Jew soothingly. Here it is, all safe. As he spoke he drew forth an old cotton handkerchief from his breast, and untying a large knot in one corner, produced a small brown paper packet. Sykes, snatching it from him, hastily opened it, and proceeded to count the sovereigns it contained. "'This is all, is it?' inquired Sykes. "'All,' replied the Jew. "'You haven't opened the parcel and swallowed one or two as you come along, have you?' inquired Sykes suspiciously. Don't put on an injured look at the question. You've done it many a time. Jerk the tinkler. These words in plain English conveyed an injunction to ring the bell. It was answered by another Jew, younger than Fagin, but nearly as vile and repulsive in appearance. Bill Sykes merely pointed to the empty measure. The Jew, perfectly understanding the hint, retired to fill it, previously exchanging a remarkable look with Fagin, who raised his eyes for an instant as if in expectation of it, and shook his head in reply so slightly that the action would have been almost imperceptible to an observant third person. It was lost upon Sykes, who was stooping at the moment to tie the boot-lace which the dog had torn. Possibly if he had observed the brief interchange of signals he might have thought that it boded no good to him. "'Is anybody here, Barney?' inquired Fagin, speaking now that Sykes was looking on, without raising his eyes from the ground. "'Not a soul,' replied Barney, whose words, whether they came from the heart or not, made their way through the nose. "'Nobody,' inquired Fagin, in a tone of surprise, which perhaps might mean that Barney was at liberty to tell the truth. "'Nobody but Miss Nancy,' replied Barney. "'Nancy!' exclaimed Sykes. "'Where?' 
Strike me blind if I don't honour that there girl for a night of talents. She's been having the plate of boiled beef at the bar, replied Barney. Send her here, said Sykes, pouring out a glass of liquor. Send her here. Barney looked timidly at Fagin, as if for permission. The Jew remaining silent and not lifting his eyes from the ground, he retired and presently returned ushering in Nancy, who was decorated with a bonnet, apron, basket, and street door key complete. "'You are on the scent, are you, Nancy?' inquired Sykes, proffering the glass. "'Yes, I am, Bill,' replied the young lady, disposing of its contents. "'And tired enough of it I am, too. The young brat's been ill and confined to the crib, and—' "'Ah, Nancy, dear,' said Fagin, looking up. Now, whether a peculiar contraction of the Jew's red eyebrows and a half-closing of his deeply set eyes warned Miss Nancy that she was disposed to be too communicative, is not a matter of much importance. The fact is all we care for here, and the fact is that she suddenly checked herself, and with several gracious smiles upon Mr. Sykes, turned the conversation to other matters. In about ten minutes' time Mr. Fagin was seized with a fit of coughing, upon which Nancy pulled her shawl over her shoulders, and declared it was time to go. Mr. Sykes, finding that he was walking a short part of her way himself, expressed his intention of accompanying her and they went away together, followed at a little distance, by the dog who stunk out of a back yard as soon as his master was out of sight. The Jew thrust his head out of the room door when Sykes had left it, looked after him as he walked up the passage, shook his clenched fist, muttered a deep curse, and then, with a horrible grin, reseated himself at the table, where he was soon deeply absorbed in the interesting pages of the hue and cry. Meanwhile, Oliver Twist, little dreaming that he was within so very short a distance of the merry old gentleman, was on his way to the bookstall. When he got into Clerkenwell he accidentally turned down a by-street which was not exactly in his way. But not discovering his mistake until he had got half-way down it, and knowing it must lead in the right direction, he did not think it worth while to turn back, and so marched on as quickly as he could with the books under his arm. He was walking along, thinking how happy and contented he ought to feel, and how much he would give for only one look at poor Dick, who, starved and beaten, might be weeping bitterly at that very moment, when he was startled by a young woman screaming out very loud, "'Oh, my dear brother!' And he had hardly looked up to see what the matter was, when he was stopped by having a pair of arms thrown tight around his neck. "'Don't!' cried Oliver, struggling. "'Let go of me. Who is it? What are you stopping me for?' The only reply to this was a great number of loud lamentations from the young woman who had embraced him, and who had a little basket and a street-door key in her hand. "'Oh, my gracious!' said the young woman. "'I have found him! Oh, Oliver! Oliver! Oh, you naughty boy, to make me suffer such distress on your account! Come home, dear, come! Oh, I found him! Thank gracious goodness heavens, I found him!' With these incoherent exclamations the young woman burst into another fit of crying, and got so dreadfully hysterical that a couple of women who came up at that moment asked the butcher's boy with a shiny head of hair anointed with suet, who was also looking on, whether he didn't think he had better run for the doctor, to which the butcher's boy, who appeared of a lounging, not to say indolent disposition, replied that he thought not. "'Oh, no, no, never mind,' said the young woman, grasping Oliver's hand. "'I'm better now. Come home directly, you cruel boy, come!' "'What's the matter, ma'am?' inquired one of the women. "'Oh, ma'am,' replied the young woman, "'he ran away near a month ago from his parents, who were hard-working and respectable people, and went and joined a set of thieves and bad characters, and almost broke his mother's heart.' "'Young wretch!' said one woman. "'Go home, you little brute,' said the other. "'I am not,' replied Oliver, gravely alarmed. "'I don't know her. I haven't any sister, or father and mother either. I'm an orphan. I live at Pentonville.' "'Only hear him how he braves it out!' cried the young woman. "'Why, it's Nancy!' exclaimed Oliver, who now saw her face for the first time, and started back in irrepressible astonishment. "'You see, he knows me!' cried Nancy, appealing to the bystanders. "'He can't help himself. Make him come home. There's good people, or he'll kill his dear mother and father and break my heart!' "'What the devil's this?' said a man, bursting out of a beer-shop, with a white dog at his heels. "'Young Oliver, come home to your poor mother, you young dog. Come home directly!' 
I don't belong to them. I don't know them. Help! Help! cried Oliver, struggling in the man's powerful grasp. Help! repeated the man. Yes, I'll help you, you young rascal. What books are these? You've been stealing them, have you? Give them here. With these words the man tore the volumes from his grasp and struck him on the head. That's right, cried a looker-on from a garret window. That's the way of bringing him to his senses. To be sure, said a sleepy-faced carpenter, casting an approving look at the garret window. It'll do him good, said the two women. And he shall have it too, rejoined the man, administering another blow and seizing Oliver by the collar. Come on, you young villain. Here, bull's-eye. Mind him, boy. Mind him. Weak with recent illness, stupefied by the blows and the suddenness of the attack, terrified by the fierce growling of the dog and the brutality of the man, overpowered by the conviction of the bystanders that he really was the hardened little wretch he was described to be, what could one poor child do? Darkness had set in. It was a low neighbourhood. No help was near. Resistance was useless. In another moment he was dragged into a labyrinth of dark, narrow courts and was forced along them at a pace which rendered the few cries he dared to give utterance to unintelligible. It was a little moment, indeed, whether they were intelligible or no, for there was nobody to care for them, had they been ever so plain. The gas-lamps were lighted, Mrs. Bedwin was waiting anxiously at the open door, the servant had run up the street twenty times to see if there were any traces of Oliver and still the two old gentlemen sat perseveringly in the dark parlour with a watch between them. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Hines Relates what became of Oliver Twist after he had been claimed by Nancy. The narrow streets and courts at length terminated in a large open space, scattered about which were pens for beasts and other indications of a cattle market. Sykes slackened his pace when they reached this spot, the girl being quite unable to support any longer the rapid rate at which they had hitherto walked. Turning to Oliver, he roughly commanded him to take hold of Nancy's hand. "'Do you hear?' growled Sykes, as Oliver hesitated and looked round. They were in a dark corner, quite out of the track of passengers. Oliver saw but too plainly that resistance would be of no avail. He held out his hand, which Nancy clasped tight in hers. "'Give me the other,' said Sykes, seizing Oliver's unoccupied hand. "'Here, bull's eye. The dog looked up and growled. "'See here, boy,' said Sykes, putting the other hand to Oliver's throat. "'If he speaks ever so soft a word, hold him, do you mind?' The dog growled again, and, licking his lips, eyed Oliver as if he were anxious to attach himself to his windpipe without delay. "'He's as willing as a Christian. Strike me blind if he ain't,' said Sykes, regarding the animal with a kind of grim and ferocious approval. "'Now, you know what you've got to expect, master. So call away as quick as you like. The dog'll soon stop that game. Get on, young un. Bullseye wagged his tail in acknowledgment of this unusually endearing form of speech, and, giving vent to another admonitory growl for the benefit of Oliver, led the way onward. It was Smithfield that they were crossing, though it might have been Grosvenor Square for anything Oliver knew to the contrary. The night was dark and foggy. The lights in the shops could scarcely struggle through the heavy mists which thickened every moment and shrouded the streets and houses in gloom, rendering the strange place still stranger in Oliver's eyes and making his uncertainty the more dismal and depressing. They had hurried on a few paces when a deep church-bell struck the hour. With its first stroke his two conductors stopped, and turned their heads in the direction whence the sound proceeded. "'Eight o'clock, Bill,' said Nancy, when the bell ceased. "'What's the good of telling me that? I can hear it, can't I?' replied Sykes. "'I wonder whether they can hear it,' said Nancy. "'Of course they can,' replied Sykes. It was Bartlemy time when I was shopped, and there weren't a penny trumpet in the fair as I couldn't hear the squeaking on. After I was locked up for the night, the row and din outside made the thundering old jail so silent that I could almost have beat my brains out against the iron plates of the door. Poor fellows, said Nancy, who still had her face turned towards the quarter in which the bell had sounded. Oh, Bill, such fine young chaps as them. Yes, that's all you women think of, answered Sykes. Fine young chaps. Well, they're as good as dead, so it don't much matter. 
With his consolation Mr. Sykes appeared to repress a rising tendency to jealousy, and, clasping Oliver's wrist more firmly, told him to step out again. "'Wait a minute,' said the girl. "'I wouldn't hurry by if it was you that was coming out to be young the next time eight o'clock struck, Bill. I'd walk round and round the place till I dropped, if the snow was on the ground and I hadn't a shawl to cover me.' "'And what good would that do?' inquired the unsentimental Mr. Sykes. "'Unless you could pitch over a file and twenty yards of good stout rope, you might as well be walking fifty mile off, or not walking at all for the good it would do me. Come on, don't stand preaching there.' The girl burst into a laugh, drew her shawl more closely round her, and they walked away. But Oliver felt her hand tremble, and looking up in her face as they passed the gas-lamp saw that it had turned a deadly white. They walked on by little frequented and dirty ways for a full half-hour and meeting very few people, and those appearing from their looks, to hold much the same position in society as Mr. Sykes himself. At length they turned into a very filthy, narrow street, nearly full of old clothes-shops. The dog running forward, as if conscious that there was no further occasion for its keeping guard, stopped before the door of a shop that was closed and apparently untenanted. The house was in a ruinous condition, and on the door was nailed a board intimating that it was to let which looked as if it had hung there for many years. "'All right,' cried Sykes, glancing cautiously about. Nancy stooped below the shutters, and Oliver heard the sound of a bell. They crossed to the opposite side of the street, and stood for a few moments under a lamp. A noise, as if a sash window were gently raised, was heard, and soon afterwards the door softly opened. Mr. Sykes then seized the terrified boy by the collar with very little ceremony, and all three were quickly inside the house. The passage was perfectly dark. They waited while the person who had let them in chained and barred the door. "'Anybody here?' inquired Sykes. "'No,' replied a voice, which Oliver thought he had heard before. "'Is the old one here?' asked the robber. "'Yes,' replied the voice. "'And precious down in the mouth he has been. Won't he be glad to see you? Oh, no!' The style of this reply, as well as the voice which delivered it, seemed familiar to Oliver's ears, but it was impossible to distinguish even the form of the speaker in the darkness. "'Let's have a glim,' said Sykes, "'or we shall go breaking our necks or treading on the dog. We'll look after your legs if you do.' "'Stand still a moment, and I'll get you one,' replied the voice. The receding footsteps of the speaker were heard, and, in another minute, the form of Mr. John Dawkins, otherwise the artful dodger, appeared. He bore in his right hand a tallow candle stuck in the end of a cleft stick. The young gentleman did not stop to bestow any other remark of recognition upon Oliver than a humorous grin, but turning away beckoned the visitors to follow him down a flight of stairs. They crossed an empty kitchen, and opening the door of a low earthy-smelling room which seemed to have been built in a small back yard, were received with a shout of laughter. "'Oh, my wig! my wig!' cried Master Charlie Bates from whose lungs the laughter had proceeded. "'Here he is! Oh, cry, here he is! Oh, Fagin, look at him! Fagin, do look at him! I can't bear it! It's such a jolly game! I can't bear it! Hold me somebody while I laugh it out!' <laughs> With this irrepressible ebullition of mirth Master Bates laid himself flat on the floor, and kicked convulsively for five minutes in an ecstasy of facetious joy. Then, jumping to his feet, he snatched the cleft stick from the dodger, and, advancing to Oliver, viewed him round and round, while the Jew, taking off his nightcap, made a great number of low bows to the bewildered boy. The artful, meanwhile, who was of a rather saturnine disposition, and seldom gave way to merriment when it interfered with business, rifled Oliver's pockets with steady assiduity. "'Look at his togs, Fagin,' said Charlie, putting the light so close to his new jacket as nearly to set him on fire. Look at his togs! Superfine cloth and a heavy swell cut. Oh, my eye, what a game! And his books, too! Nothing but a gentleman, Fagin! Delighted to see you looking so well, my dear, said the Jew, bowing with mock humility. The artful should give you another suit, my dear, for fear you should spoil that Sunday one. Why didn't you write, my dear, and say you were coming? We'd have got something warm for supper. At this Master Bates roared again, so loud that Fagin himself relaxed, and even the dodger smiled, but as the artful drew forth the five-pound note at that instant, it is doubtful whether the sally of the discovery awakened his merriment. "'Hello, what's that?' inquired Sykes, stepping forward as the Jew seized the note. "'That's mine, Fagin.' "'No, no, my dear,' said the Jew. 
Mine, Bill, mine. You shall have the books. If that ain't mine, said Bill Sykes, putting on his hat with a determined air, mine and Nancy's, that is, I'll take the boy back again. The Jew started. Oliver started too, though from a very different cause, for he hoped that the dispute might really end in his being taken back. Come, and over, will you? said Sykes. This is hardly fair, Bill. Hardly fair, is it, Nancy? inquired the Jew. Fair or not fair, retorted Sykes, and over, I tell you. Do you think Nancy and me has got nothing else to do with our precious time but to spend it scouting after and kidnapping every young boy as gets grabbed through you? Give it here, you avaricious old skeleton. Give it here. With this gentle remonstrance, Mr. Sykes plucked the note from between the Jew's finger and thumb, and looking the old man coolly in the face, folded it up small and tied it in his neckerchief. That's for our share of the trouble, said Sykes, and not half enough neither. You may keep the books if you're fond of reading. If you ain't, sell em. They're very pretty, said Charlie Bates, who, with sundry grimaces, had been affecting to read one of the volumes in question. Beautiful writing, isn't it, Oliver? At sight of the dismayed look with which Oliver regarded his tormentors, Master Bates, who was blessed with a lively sense of the ludicrous, fell into another ecstasy, more boisterous than the first. They belong to the old gentleman, said Oliver, wringing his hands, to the good, kind old gentleman who took me into his house and had me nursed when I was near dying of the fever. Oh, pray send them back, send them back his books and money. Keep me here all my life long, but pray, pray send them back. He'll think I stole them. The old lady, all of them who were so kind to me, will think I stole them. Oh, do have mercy upon me and send them back. With these words, which were uttered with all the energy of passionate grief, Oliver fell upon his knees at the Jew's feet and beat his hands together in perfect desperation. "'The boy's right,' remarked Fagin, looking covertly round and knitting his shaggy eyebrows into a hard knot. "'You're right, Oliver, you're right. They will think you have stolen them,' <laughs> chuckled the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'It couldn't have happened better if we had chosen our time.' "'Course it couldn't,' replied Sykes. "'I know that directly I see them coming through Clerkenwell with the books under his arm. That's all right enough. They're soft-hearted psalm-singers that they wouldn't have taken him in at all, and they'll ask no questions after him. Fear they should be obliged to prosecute and so get him lagged. He's safe enough.' Oliver had looked from one to the other while these words were being spoken, as if he were bewildered and could scarcely understand what passed but when Bill Sykes concluded he jumped suddenly to his feet and tore wildly from the room, uttering shrieks for help which made the bare old house echo to the roof. "'Keep back the dog, Bill!' cried Nancy, springing before the door and closing it, as the Jew and his two pupils darted out in pursuit. "'Keep back the dog! he will tear the boy to pieces!' "'Serve him right!' cried Sykes, struggling to disengage himself from the girl's grasp. "'Stand off from me or I'll split your head against the wall!' "'I don't care for that, Bill, I don't care for that!' screamed the girl, struggling violently with the man. "'The child shan't be torn down by the dog unless you kill me first. "'Shan't he?' said Sykes, setting his teeth. "'I'll soon do that if you don't keep off!' The housebreaker flung the girl from him to the further end of the room, just as the Jew and the two boys returned, dragging Oliver among them. "'What's the matter here?' said Fagin, looking round. "'The girl's gone mad, I think,' replied Sykes savagely. No, she hasn't, said Nancy, pale and breathless from the scuffle. No, she hasn't, Fagin. Don't think it. Then keep quiet, will you? said the Jew, with a threatening look. No, I won't do that neither, replied Nancy, speaking very loud. Come, what do you think of that? Mr. Fagin was sufficiently well acquainted with the manners and customs of that particular species of humanity to which Nancy belonged, to feel tolerably certain that it would be rather unsafe to prolong any conversation with her at present. With the view of diverting the attention of the company, he turned to Oliver. "'So you wanted to get away, my dear, did you?' said the Jew, taking up a jagged and knotted club which lay in a corner of the fireplace. Hey? Oliver made no reply, but he watched the Jew's motions and breathed quickly. "'Wanted to get assistance? Call for the police, did you?' sneered the Jew, catching the boy by the arm. Oh, "'He'll cure you of that, my young master!' The Jew inflicted a smart blow on Oliver's shoulder with the club, and was raising it for a second when the girl, rushing forward, wrested it from his hand. She flung it into the fire with a force that brought some of the glowing coals whirling out into the room. 
"'I won't stand by and see it done, Fagin,' cried the girl. "'You've got the boy, and what more would you have? Let him be, let him be, or I shall put that mark on some of you that will bring me to the gallows before my time.' The girl stamped her foot violently on the floor as she vented this threat, and with her lips compressed and her hands clenched, looked alternately at the Jew and the other robber, her face quite colourless from the passion of rage into which she had gradually worked herself. "'Why, Nancy,' said the Jew in a soothing tone, after a pause during which he and Mr. Sykes had stared at one another in a disconcerted manner. "'You, you're more clever than ever to-night. <laughs> My dear, you are acting beautifully.' "'Am I?' said the girl. "'Take care I don't ever do it. You'll be the worse for it, Fagin, if I do. And so I tell you in good time to keep clear of me.' There is something about a roused woman, especially if she adds to all her other strong passions, the fierce impulses of recklessness and despair, which few men like to provoke. The Jew saw that it would be hopeless to effect any further mistake regarding the reality of Miss Nancy's rage, and shrinking involuntarily back a few paces, cast a glance half imploring and half cowardly at Sykes, as if to hint that he was the fittest person to pursue the dialogue. Mr. Sykes, thus mutely appealed to, and possibly feeling his personal pride and influence interested in the immediate reduction of Miss Nancy to reason, gave utterance to about a couple of score of curses and threats, the rapid production of which reflected great credit on the fertility of his invention. As they produced no visible effect on the object against whom they were discharged, however, he resorted to more tangible arguments. "'What do you mean by this?' said Sykes, backing up the inquiry with a very common implication concerning the most beautiful of human features, which, if it were heard above only once out of every fifty thousand times that it is uttered below, would render blindness as common a disorder as measles. "'What do you mean by it? Burn my body! Do you know who you are and what you are?' "'Oh, yes, I know all about it,' replied the girl, laughing hysterically and shaking her head from side to side, with a poor assumption of indifference. "'Well, then, keep quiet,' rejoined Sykes, with a growl like that he was accustomed to use when addressing his dog, "'or I'll quiet you for a good long time to come.' The girl laughed again, even less composedly than before, and darting a hasty look at Sykes, turned her face aside and bit her lip till the blood came. "'You're a nice one,' added Sykes, as he surveyed her with a contemptuous air, "'to take up the humane and genteel side. A pretty subject for the child, as you call him, to make a friend of.' "'God Almighty help me, I am!' cried the girl passionately. "'And I wish I had been struck dead in the street, or had changed places with them we passed so near to-night, before I had lent a hand in bringing him here. He's a thief, a liar, a devil, all that's bad from this night forth.' Isn't that enough for the old wretch without blows? Come, come, Sykes, said the Jew, appealing to him in a remonstratory tone, and motioning towards the boys who were eagerly attentive to all that passed. We must have civil words. Civil words, Bill. Civil words, cried the girl, whose passion was frightful to see. Civil words, you villain. Yes, you deserve em from me. I thieved for you when I was a child not half as old as this, pointing to Oliver. I have been in the same trade and in the same service for twelve years since. Don't you know it? Speak out. Don't you know it?" "'Well, well,' replied the Jew, with an attempt at pacification. "'And if you have, it's your living.' "'Aye, it is,' returned the girl, not speaking, but pouring out the words in one continuous and vehement scream. "'It is my living, and the cold, wet, dirty streets of my home, and you're the wretch that drove me into them long ago, and that'll keep me there day and night, day and night, till I die.' "'I shall do you a mischief,' interposed the Jew, goaded by these reproaches. "'A mischief worse than that, if you say much more.' The girl said nothing more, but tearing her hair and dress in a transport of passion, made such a rush at the Jew as would probably have left signal marks of her revenge upon him, had not her wrists been seized by Sykes at the right moment, upon which she made a few ineffectual struggles and fainted. "'She's all right now,' said Sykes, laying her down in the corner. "'She's uncommon strong in the arms when she's up in this way.' The Jew wiped his forehead and smiled, as if it were a relief to have the disturbance over but neither he, nor Sykes, nor the dog, nor the boys, seemed to consider it in any other light than a common occurrence, incidental to the business. "'It's the worst of having to do with women,' said the Jew, replacing his club. "'But they're clever, and we can't get on in our line without them.' "'Charlie, shall Oliver to bed?' 
"'I suppose he'd better not wear his best clothes tomorrow, Fagin, had he?' inquired Charlie Bates. "'Certainly not,' replied the Jew, reciprocating the grin with which Charlie put the question. Master Bates, apparently much delighted with his commission, took the cleft stick and led Oliver to an adjacent kitchen, where there were two or three beds on which he had slept before, and here, with many uncontrollable bursts of laughter, he produced the identical old suit of clothes which Oliver had so much congratulated himself upon leaving off at Mr. Brownlow's, and the accidental display of which, to Fagin by the Jew who purchased them, had been the very first clue received of his whereabouts. "'Put off the smart ones,' said Charlie, "'and I'll give them to Fagin to take care of. <laughs> what fun it is!' Poor Oliver unwillingly complied. Master Bates, rolling up the new clothes under his arm, departed from the room, leaving Oliver in the dark and locking the door behind him. The noise of Charlie's laughter and the voice of Miss Betsy, who opportunely arrived to throw water over her friend and perform other feminine offices for the promotion of her recovery, might have kept many people awake under more happy circumstances than those in which Oliver was placed. But he was sick and weary, and he soon fell sound asleep. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines Oliver's destiny, continuing unpropitious, brings a great man to London to injure his reputation. It is the custom on the stage in all good murderous melodramas to present the tragic and the comic scenes in as regular alternation as the layers of red and white in a side of streaky bacon. The hero sinks upon his straw bed, weighed down by fetters and misfortunes. In the next scene his faithful but unconscious squire regales the audience with a comic song. We behold with throbbing bosoms the heroine in the grasp of a proud and ruthless baron, her virtue and her life alike in danger, drawing forth her dagger to preserve the one at the cost of the other. And just as our expectations are wrought up to the highest pitch, a whistle is heard, and we are straightway transported to the great hall of the castle, where a grey-headed seneschal sings a funny chorus with a funnier body of vassals, who are free of all sorts of places, from church vaults to palaces, and roam about in company carolling perpetually. Such changes appear absurd, but they are not so unnatural as they would seem at first sight. The transitions in real life from well-spread boards to death-beds, and from mourning-weeds to holiday garments, are not a whit less startling. Only there we are busy actors instead of passive lookers-on, which makes a vast difference. The actors in the mimic life of the theatre are blind to violent transitions and abrupt impulses of passion or feeling, which, presented before the eyes of mere spectators, are at once condemned as outrageous and preposterous. As sudden shiftings of the scene and rapid changes of time and place are not only sanctioned in books by long usage, but are by many considered as the great art of authorship, an author's skill in his craft being by such critics chiefly estimated with relation to the dilemmas in which he leaves his characters at the end of every chapter, this brief introduction to the present one may perhaps be deemed unnecessary. If so, let it be considered a delicate intimation on the part of the historian that he is going back to the town in which Oliver Twist was born, the reader taking it for granted that there are good and substantial reasons for making the journey, or he would not be invited to proceed upon such an expedition. Mr. Bumble emerged at early morning from the workhouse gate, and walked with portly carriage and commanding steps up the high street. He was in the full bloom and pride of beadlehood. His cocked hat and coat were dazzling in the morning sun. He clutched his cane with the vigorous tenacity of health and power. Mr. Bumble always carried his head high, but this morning it was higher than usual. There was an abstraction in his eye, an elevation in his air, which might have warned an observant stranger that thoughts were passing in the beadle's mind too great for utterance. Mr. Bumble stopped not to converse with the small shopkeepers and others who spoke to him deferentially as he passed along. He merely returned their salutations with a wave of his hand, and relaxed not in his dignified pace, until he reached the farm where Mrs. Mann tended the infant paupers with parochial care. "'Drat that beadle!' said Mrs. Mann, hearing the well-known shaking at the garden gate. "'If it isn't him at this time in the morning! Look, Mr. Bumble, only think of its being you! Well, dear me, it is a pleasure this is! Come into the parlour, sir, please!' The first sentence was addressed to Susan and the exclamations of delight were uttered to Mr. Bumble, 
as the good lady unlocked the garden gate and showed him with great attention and respect into the house uh, mrs mann said mr bumble not sitting upon or dropping himself into a seat as any common jack and apes would but letting himself gradually and slowly down into a chair mrs mann ma'am good morning well and good morning to you sir replied mrs mann with many smiles and hoping you find yourself well sir so so mrs mann replied the beadle a parochial life is not a bed of roses mrs mann ah that it isn't indeed mr bumble rejoined the lady and all the infant paupers might have chorused the rejoinder with great propriety if they had heard it a parochial life ma'am continued mr bumble striking the table with his cane is a life of worrit and vexation and hardihood but all public characters as i may say must suffer prosecution mrs mann not very well knowing what the beadle meant raised her hands with a look of sympathy and sighed ah you may well sigh mrs mann said the beadle finding she had done right mrs mann sighed again evidently to the satisfaction of the public character who repressing a complacent smile by looking sternly at his cocked hat said uh, mrs mann i am going to london look mr bumble cried mrs mann starting back to london ma'am resumed the inflexible beadle by couch i and two paupers mrs mann a legal action is a coming on about a settlement and the board has appointed me a me mrs mann to depose to the matter before the quota sessions at clerkenwell and i very much question added mr bumble drawing himself up whether the clerk about sessions will not find themselves at the wrong box before they have done with me oh you mustn't be too hard upon them sir said mrs mann coaxingly the clerkenwell sessions have brought it upon themselves ma'am replied mr bumble and if the clerkenwell sessions find that they come off rather worse than they expected the clerkenwell sessions have only themselves to thank there was so much determination and depth of purpose about the menacing manner in which mr bumble delivered himself of these words that mrs mann appeared quite awed by them at length she said you're going by coach sir i thought it was always usual to send them paupers in carts that's when they're ill mrs mann said the beadle we put the sick paupers into open carts in the rainy weather to prevent their taking cold oh said mrs mann the opposition coach contracts for these two and takes them cheap said mr bumble they are both in a very low state and we find it would come two pound cheaper to move them than to bury them that is if we can throw them upon another parish which i think we shall be able to do if they don't die upon the road to spite us <laughs> when mr bumble had laughed a little while his eyes again encountered the cocked hat and he became grave uh, we are forgetting business ma'am said the beadle here's your parochial stipend for the month mr bumble produced some silver money rolled up in paper from his pocket-book and requested a receipt which mrs mann wrote it's very much blotted sir said the farmer of infants but it's formal enough i dare say thank you mr bumble sir i'm very much obliged to you i'm sure Mr. Bumble nodded blandly in acknowledgment of Mrs. Mann's curtsy, and inquired how the children were. "'Bless their dear little hearts,' said Mrs. Mann, with emotion. "'They're as well as can be, the dears, of course, except the two that died last week, and little Dick.' "'Isn't that boy no better?' inquired Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Mann shook her head. "'He's a ill-conditioned, wishes, bad-disposed, parochial child, that,' said Mr. Bumble angrily. "'Where is he?' i'll bring him to you in one minute sir replied mrs mann eh you dick after some calling dick was discovered having had his face put under the pump and dried upon mrs mann's gown he was led into the awful presence of mr bumble the beadle the child was pale and thin his cheeks were sunken and his eyes large and bright the scanty parish dress the livery of his misery hung loosely on his feeble body and his young limbs had wasted away like those of an old man. Such was the little being who stood trembling beneath Mr. Bumble's glance, not daring to lift his eyes from the floor, and dreading even to hear the beadle's voice. "'Can't you look at the gentleman, you obstinate boy?' said Mrs. Mann. The child meekly raised his eyes and encountered those of Mr. Bumble. "'What's the matter with you, parochial Dick?' inquired Mr. Bumble, with well-timed jocularity. "'Nothing, sir.' said the child faintly i should think not said mrs mann who had of course laughed very much at mr bumble's humour you want for nothing i'm sure i should like 
faltered the child. "'Hey, Jay,' interposed Mrs. Mann, "'I suppose you're going to say that you do want for something now. Why, you little wretch!' "'Stop, Mrs. Mann, stop,' said the beadle, raising his hand with a show of authority. "'Like what, sir? Eh?' "'I should like,' faltered the child, "'if somebody that can write would put a few words down for me on a piece of paper, and fold it up and seal it and keep it for me, after I am laid in the ground.' "'Why, what does the boy mean?' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, on whom the earnest manner and wan aspect of the child had made some impression, accustomed as he was to such things. "'What do you mean, sir?' "'I should like,' said the child, "'to leave my dear love to poor Oliver Twist, and to let him know how often I have sat by myself and cried to think of his wandering about in the dark nights, with nobody to help him. And I should like to tell him,' said the child, pressing his small hands together, and speaking with great fervour, that I was glad to die when I was very young, for perhaps if I had lived to be a man and had grown old, my little sister who was in heaven might forget me or be unlike me, and it would be much happier if we were both children there together." Mr. Bumble surveyed the little speaker from head to foot with indescribable astonishment, and turning to his companion said, "'They're all in one story, Mrs. Mann. That outdacious Oliver has demodulized them all. "'I couldn't have believed it, sir,' said Mrs. Mann, holding up her hands and looking malignantly at Dick. "'I'd never see such a hardened little wretch.' "'Take him away, ma'am,' said the beadle imperiously. "'This must be stated to the board, Mrs. Mann.' Oh, "'I hope the gentleman will understand that it isn't my fault, sir,' said Mrs. Mann, whimpering pathetically. "'They shall understand that, ma'am. They shall be acquainted with the true state of the case,' said Mr. Bumble. "'There, take him away. I can't bear the sight on him.' Dick was immediately taken away and locked up in the cold cellar. Mr. Bumble, shortly afterwards, took himself off to prepare for his journey. At six o'clock next morning Mr. Bumble, having exchanged his cocked hat for a round one, and encased his person in a blue great coat with a cape to it, took his place on the outside of the coach accompanied by the criminals whose settlement was disputed, with whom in due course of time he arrived in London. He experienced no other crosses on the way than those which originated in the perverse behaviour of the two paupers, who persisted in shivering and complaining of the cold, in a manner which Mr. Bumble declared caused his teeth to chatter in his head and made him feel quite uncomfortable, although he had a great coat on. Having disposed of these evil-minded persons for the night, Mr. Bumble sat himself down in the house at which the coach stopped, and took a temperate dinner of steaks, oyster-sauce, and porter. Putting a glass of hot gin and water on the chimney-piece, he drew his chair to the fire, and with sundry moral reflections on the too prevalent sin of discontent and complaining, composed himself to read the paper. The very first paragraph upon which Mr. Bumble's eye rested was the following advertisement. Five guineas reward whereas a young boy named Oliver Twist absconded, or was enticed, on Thursday evening last from his home at Pentonville, and has not since been heard of. The above reward will be paid to any person who will give such information as will lead to the discovery of the said Oliver Twist, or tend to throw any light upon his previous history, in which the advertiser is, for many reasons, warmly interested. And then followed a full description of Oliver's dress, person, appearance, and disappearance with the name and address of Mr. Brownlow at full length. Mr. Bumble opened his eyes, read the advertisement slowly and carefully three several times, and in something more than five minutes was on his way to Pentonville, having actually in his excitement left a glass of hot gin and water untasted. "'Is Mr. Brownlow at home?' inquired Mr. Bumble of the girl who opened the door. To this inquiry the girl returned a not uncommon, but rather evasive reply of, "'I don't know.' Where do you come from?" Mr. Bumble no sooner uttered Oliver's name in explanation of his errand than Mrs. Bedwin, who had been listening at the parlour door, hastened into the passage in a breathless state. "'Come in, come in,' said the old lady. "'I knew we should hear of him. Poor dear, I knew we should. I was certain of it. Bless his heart. I said so all along.' Having said this, the worthy old lady hurried back into the parlour again, and seating herself on a sofa, burst into tears. The girl, who was not quite so susceptible, had run upstairs meanwhile, and now returned with a request that Mr. Bumble would follow her immediately, which he did. He was shown into the little back study, where sat Mr. Brownlow and his friend Mr. Grimwig, 
with decanters and glasses before them. The latter gentleman at once burst into the exclamation, "'A beadle! A parish beadle, or I'll eat my head!' "'Pray, don't interrupt just now,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Take a seat, will you?' Mr. Bumble sat himself down, quite confounded by the oddity of Mr. Grimwig's manner. Mr. Brownlow moved the lamp so as to obtain an uninterrupted view of the beadle's countenance, and said with a little impatience, "'Now, sir, you come in consequence of having seen the advertisement.' "'Yes, sir,' said Mr. Bumble. "'And you are a beadle, are you not?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. "'I am a parochial beadle, gentlemen,' rejoined Mr. Bumble proudly. "'Of course,' observed Mr. Grimwig aside to his friend, "'I knew he was. A beadle all over.' Mr. Brownlow gently shook his head to impose silence on his friend, and resumed. "'Do you know where this poor boy is now?' "'No more than nobody,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Well, what do you know of him?' inquired the old gentleman. "'Speak out, my friend, if you have anything to say. What do you know of him?' "'You don't happen to know any good of him, do you?' said Mr. Grimwig caustically, after an attentive perusal of Mr. Bumble's features. Mr. Bumble, catching at the inquiry very quickly, shook his head with portentous solemnity. "'You see,' said Mr. Grimwig, looking triumphantly at Mr. Brownlow. Mr. Brownlow looked apprehensively at Mr. Bumble's pursed-up countenance, and requested him to communicate what he knew regarding Oliver, in as few words as possible. Mr. Bumble put down his hat, unbuttoned his coat, folded his arms, inclined his head in a retrospective manner, and after a few moments' reflection commenced his story. It would be tedious if given in the beadle's words, occupying as it did some twenty minutes in the telling, but the sum and substance of it was that Oliver was a foundling, born of low and vicious parents, that he had from his birth displayed no better qualities than treachery, ingratitude, and malice, that he had terminated his brief career in the place of his birth by making a sanguinary and cowardly attack on an unoffending lad, and running away in the night-time from his master's house. In proof of his really being the person he represented himself, Mr. Bumble laid upon the table the papers he had brought to town. Folding his arms again, he then awaited Mr. Brownlow's observations. "'I fear it is all too true,' said the old gentleman sorrowfully, after looking over the papers. "'This is not much for your intelligence, but I would gladly have given you treble the money if it had been favourable to the boy. It is not at all improbable that if Mr. Bumble had been possessed of this information at an earlier period of the interview, he might have imparted a very different colouring to his little history. It was too late to do it now, however, so he shook his head gravely, and pocketing the five guineas, withdrew. Mr. Brownlow paced the room to and fro for some minutes, evidently so much disturbed by the beadle's tale, that even Mr. Grimwig forbore to vex him further. At length he stopped and rang the bell violently. "'Mrs. Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow, when the housekeeper appeared, "'that boy Oliver is an impostor. "'It can't be, sir, it cannot be,' said the old lady energetically. "'I tell you he is,' retorted the old gentleman. "'What do you mean by can't be? "'We've just heard a full account of him from his birth, "'and he has been a thorough-paced little villain all his life.' "'I never will believe it, sir,' replied the old lady firmly. "'Never.' "'You old women never believe anything but quack doctors and lying story-books,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'I knew it all along. Why didn't you take my advice in the beginning? You would if you hadn't had a fever, I suppose, eh? He was interesting, wasn't he? Interesting! Bah! And Mr. Grimwig poked the fire with a flourish. "'He was a dear grateful gentle child, sir,' retorted Mrs. Bedwin indignantly. "'I know what children are, sir, and have done these forty years and people who can't say the same shouldn't say anything about them. That's my opinion." This was a hard hit at Mr. Grimwig, who was a bachelor. As it extorted nothing from that gentleman but a smile, the old lady tossed her head and smoothed down her apron preparatory to another speech, when she was stopped by Mr. Brownlow. "'Silence,' said the old gentleman, feigning an anger he was far from feeling. "'Never let me hear that boy's name again. I rang to tell you that. Never. Never on any pretense, mind. You may leave the room, Mrs. Bedwin. Remember, I am in earnest." There were sad hearts at Mr. Brownlow's that night. Oliver's heart sank within him when he thought of his good friends. It was well for him that he could not know what they had heard, or it might have broken outright. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Tig Hines. How Oliver passed his time in the improving society of his reputable friends. About noon next day, when the Dodger and Master Bates had gone out to pursue their customary avocations, Mr. Fagin took the opportunity of reading Oliver a long lecture on the crying sin of ingratitude, of which he clearly demonstrated he had been guilty, to no ordinary extent, in wilfully absenting himself from the society of his anxious friends, and still more in endeavouring to escape from them after so much trouble and expense had been incurred in his recovery. Mr. Fagin laid great stress on the fact of his having taken Oliver in, and cherished him when, without his timely aid, he might have perished with hunger, and he related the dismal and affecting history of a young lad whom, in his philanthropy, he had succoured under parallel circumstances, but who, proving unworthy of his confidence and evincing a desire to communicate with the police, had unfortunately come to be hanged at the Old Bailey one morning. Mr. Fagin did not seek to conceal his share in the catastrophe, but lamented with tears in his eyes that the wrong-headed and treacherous behaviour of the young person in question had rendered it necessary that he should become the victim of certain evidence for the Crown, which, if it were not precisely true, was indispensably necessary for the safety of him, Mr. Fagin, and a few select friends. Mr. Fagin concluded by drawing a rather disagreeable picture of the discomforts of hanging and with great friendliness and politeness of manner, expressed his anxious hopes that he might never be obliged to submit Oliver Twist to that unpleasant operation. Little Oliver's blood ran cold as he listened to the Jew's words, and imperfectly comprehended the dark threats conveyed in them. That it was possible even for justice itself to confound the innocent with the guilty when they were in accidental companionship he already knew and that deeply laid plans for the destruction of inconveniently knowing or over-communicative persons had been really devised and carried out by the Jew on more occasions than one he thought by no means unlikely, when he recollected the general nature of the altercations between that gentleman and Mr. Sykes, which seemed to bear reference to some foregone conspiracy of the kind. As he glanced timidly up and met the Jew's searching look, he felt that his pale face and trembling limbs were neither unnoticed nor unrelished by that wary old gentleman. The Jew, smiling hideously, patted Oliver on the head, and said that if he kept himself quiet and applied himself to business, he saw they would be very good friends yet. Then, taking his hat and covering himself with an old patched greatcoat, he went out and locked the room door behind him. And so Oliver remained all that day, and for the greater part of many subsequent days, seeing nobody between early morning and midnight, and left during the long hours to commune with his own thoughts, which never failing to revert to his kind friends and the opinion they must long ago have formed of him, were sad indeed. After a lapse of a week or so the Jew left the room door unlocked, and he was at liberty to wander about the house. It was a very dirty place. The rooms upstairs had great high wooden chimney-pieces and large doors, with panelled walls and cornices to the ceiling, which, although they were black with neglect and dust, were ornamented in various ways. From all of these tokens Oliver concluded that a long time ago, before the old Jew was born, it had belonged to better people, and had perhaps been quite gay and handsome, dismal and dreary as it looked now. Spiders had built their webs in the angles of the walls and ceiling, and sometimes when Oliver walked softly into a room, the mice would scamper across the floor and run back terrified to their holes. With these exceptions there was neither sight nor sound of any living thing, and often when it grew dark and he was tired of wandering from room to room, he would crouch in a corner of the passage by the street door to be as near living people as he could and would remain there listening and counting the hours until the Jew or the boys returned. In all the rooms the mouldering shutters were fast closed, the bars which held them were screwed tight into the wood, the only light which was admitted stealing its way through round holes at the top, which made the rooms more gloomy and filled them with strange shadows. There was a back garret window with rusty bars outside which had no shutter and out of this Oliver often gazed with a melancholy face for hours together. But nothing was to be descried from it but a confused and crowded mass of housetops, blackened chimneys and gable ends. Sometimes, indeed, a grisly head might be seen peering over the parapet wall of a distant house, 
but it was quickly withdrawn again, and as the window of Oliver's observatory was nailed down and dimmed with the rain and smoke of years, it was as much as he could do to make out the forms of the different objects beyond, without making any attempt to be seen or heard, which he had as much chance of being as if he had lived inside the ball of St. Paul's Cathedral. One afternoon, the Dodger and Master Bates being engaged out that evening, the first-named young gentleman took it into his head to evince some anxiety regarding the decoration of his person. To do him justice, this was by no means an habitual weakness with him. And with this end and aim he condescendingly commanded Oliver to assist him in his toilet straightway. Oliver was but too glad to make himself useful, too happy to have some faces, however bad, to look upon, too desirous to conciliate those about him when he could honestly do so, to throw any objection in the way of this proposal. So he at once expressed his readiness, and kneeling on the floor while the dodger sat upon the table so that he could take his foot in his lap, he applied himself to a process which Mr. Dawkins designated as japanning his trotter-cases. The phrase rendered into plain English signifieth cleaning his boots. Whether it was the sense of freedom and independence which a rational animal may be supposed to feel when he sits on a table, in an easy attitude, smoking a pipe, swinging one leg carelessly to and fro and having his boots cleaned all the time, without even the past trouble of having taken them off, or the prospective misery of putting them on, to disturb his reflections, or whether it was the goodness of the tobacco that soothed the feelings of the dodger, or the mildness of the beer that mollified his thoughts, he was evidently tinctured for the nonce with a spice of romance and enthusiasm foreign to his general nature. He looked down on Oliver with a thoughtful countenance for a brief space and then, raising his head and heaving a gentle sigh, said, half an abstraction and half to Master Bates, "'What a pity he isn't a prig!' "'Ah!' said Master Charlie Bates. "'He don't know what's good for him!' The Dodger sighed again and resumed his pipe, as did Charlie Bates. They both smoked for some seconds in silence. "'I suppose you don't even know what a prig is,' said the Dodger mournfully. "'I think I know that,' replied Oliver, looking up. "'It's a th—' Uh, you're one, are you not? inquired Oliver, checking himself. I am, replied the Dodger. I'd scorn to be anything else. Mr. Dawkins gave his hat a ferocious cock after delivering this sentiment and looked at Master Bates, as if to denote that he would feel obliged by his saying anything to the contrary. I am, repeated the Dodger. So's Charlie, so's Fagin, so's Sykes, so's Nancy, so's Bet. So we all are, down to the dog, and he's the downiest one of the lot. "'And the least given to preaching,' added Charlie Bates. "'He wouldn't so much as bark in a witness-box for fear of committing himself. "'No, not if you tied him up in one and left him there without whittles for a fortnight,' said the Dodger. "'Not a bit of it,' observed Charlie. "'He's a rum dog. "'Don't he look fierce at any strange cove that laughs or sings when he's in company?' pursued the Dodger. "'Won't he growl at all when he hears a fiddle playing? "'And don't he eat other dogs as ain't of his breed? "'Oh, no!' "'He's a out-and-out Christian,' said Charlie. This was merely intended as a tribute to the animal's abilities, but it was an appropriate remark in another sense if Master Bates had only known it, for there are a good many ladies and gentlemen claiming to be out-and-out -out Christians, between whom and Mr. Sykes' dog there exist strong and singular points of resemblance. "'Well, well,' said the Dodger, recurring to the point from which they had strayed, with that mindfulness of his profession which influenced all his proceedings. This hasn't got anything to do with young Green here. No more it has, said Charlie. Why don't you put yourself under Fagin, Oliver? And make your fortune out of hand, added the Dodger with a grin. And so be able to retire on your property and do the genteel, as I mean to, in the very next leap year before that ever comes, and the forty-second Tuesday in Trinity Week, said Charlie Bates. I don't like it, rejoined Oliver timidly. I wish they would let me go. I— I would rather go. And Fagin would rather not, rejoined Charlie. Oliver knew this too well, but thinking it might be dangerous to express his feelings more openly, he only sighed and went on with his boot-cleaning. Go! exclaimed the Dodger. Why, where's your spirit? Don't you take any pride out of yourself? Would you go and be dependent on your friends? Oh, blow that! said Master Bates, drawing two or three silk handkerchiefs from his pocket and tossing them into a cupboard. "'That's too mean, that is.' "'I couldn't do it,' said the Dodger, with an air of haughty disgust. "'You can leave your friends, though,' said Oliver, with a half-smile, 
and let them be punished for what you did that rejoined the dodger with a wave of his pipe that was all out of consideration for fagin cause the traps know that we worked together and he might have got into trouble if we hadn't made our lucky that was the move wasn't it charley master bates nodded assent and would have spoken but the recollection of oliver's flight came so suddenly upon him that the smoke he was inhaling got entangled with a laugh and went up into his head and down into his throat and brought on a fit of coughing and stamping about five minutes long look here said the dodger drawing forth a handful of shillings and halfpence here's a jolly life what's the odds where it comes from here catch hold there's plenty more where they were took from you won't won't you oh you precious flat it's naughty ain't it oliver inquired charley bates he'll come to be scragged won't he i i don't know what that means replied oliver something in this way old feller said charley as he said it master bates caught up an end of his neckerchief and holding it erect in the air dropped his head on his shoulder and jerked a curious sound through his teeth thereby indicating by a lively pantomimic representation that scragging and hanging were one and the same thing that's what it means said charley look how he stares jack i never did see such prime company as that ere boy he'll be the death of me i know he will master charley bates having laughed heartily again resumed his pipe with tears in his eyes you've been brought up bad said the dodger surveying his boots with much satisfaction when oliver had polished them fagin will make something of you though or you'll be the first he ever had that turned out unprofitable you'd better begin at once for you'll come to the trade long before you think of it and you're only losing time oliver master bates backed this advice with sundry moral admonitions of his own which being exhausted he and his friend mr dawkins launched into a glowing description of the numerous pleasures incidental to the life they led interspersed with a variety of hints to oliver that the best thing he could do would be to secure fagin's favour without more delay by the means which they themselves had employed to gain it and always put this in your pipe nolly said the dodger as the jew was heard unlocking the door above if you don't take fogles and tickers what's the good of talking that way interposed master bates he don't know what you mean if you don't take pocket handkerchiefs and watches said the dodger reducing his conversation to the level of oliver's capacity some other cove will so that the cove that loses him will be all the worse and you'll be all the worse too and nobody half a hape at the better except the chaps what gets them and you've just as good a right to them as they have to be sure to be sure said the jew who had entered unseen by oliver it all lies in a nutshell my dear in a nutshell take the dodger's word for it <laughs> he understands the catechism of his trade the old man rubbed his hands gleefully together as he corroborated the dodger's reasoning in these terms and chuckled with delight at his pupil's proficiency the conversation proceeded no farther at this time for the jew had returned home accompanied by miss betsy and a gentleman whom oliver had never seen before but who was accosted by the dodger as tom chitling and who having lingered on the stairs to exchange a few gallantries with the lady now made his appearance mr chitling was older in years than the dodger having perhaps numbered eighteen winters but there was a degree of deference in his deportment towards that young gentleman which seemed to indicate that he felt himself conscious of a slight inferiority in points of genius and professional acquirements he had small twinkling eyes and a pock-marked face wore a fur cap a dark corduroy jacket greasy fustian trousers and an apron his wardrobe was in truth rather out of repair but he excused himself to the company by stating that his time was out only an hour before and that in consequence of having worn the regimentals for six weeks past he had not been able to bestow any attention on his private clothes mr chitling added with strong marks of irritation that the new way of fumigating clothes up yonder was infernal unconstitutional for it burnt holes in them and there was no remedy against the county the same remark he considered to apply to the regulation mode of cutting the hair which he held to be decidedly unlawful mr chitling wound up his observations by stating that he had not touched a drop of anything for forty-two mortal long hard-working days and that he wished he might be busted if he weren't as dry as a lime basket where do you think the gentleman has come from oliver inquired the jew with a grin as the other boys put a bottle of spirits on the table i i don't know sir replied oliver who's that inquired tom chitling 
casting a contemptuous look at Oliver. "'A young friend of mine, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'He's in luck, then,' said the young man, with a meaning look at Fagin. "'Never mind where I come from, young'un. You'll find your way there soon enough, I'll bet a crown.' At this sally the boys laughed. After some more jokes on the same subject they exchanged a few short whispers with Fagin and withdrew. After some words apart between the last comer and Fagin they drew their chairs towards the fire, and the Jew, telling Oliver to come and sit by them, led the conversation to the topics most calculated to interest his hearers. These were the great advantages of the trade, the proficiency of the dodger, the amiability of Charlie Bates, and the liberality of the Jew himself. At length these subjects displayed signs of being thoroughly exhausted, and Mr. Chitling did the same for the house of correction becomes fatiguing after a week or two. Miss Betsy accordingly withdrew, and left the party to their repose. From this day Oliver was seldom left alone, but was placed in almost constant communication with the two boys, who played the old game with the Jew every day, whether for their own improvement or Oliver's Mr. Fagin knew best. At other times the old man would tell them stories of robberies he had committed in his younger days, mixed up with so much that was droll and curious that Oliver could not help laughing heartily, and showing that he was amused in spite of all his better feelings. In short, the wily old Jew had the boy in his toils. Having prepared his mind by solitude and gloom to prefer any society to the companionship of his own sad thoughts in such a dreary place, he was now slowly instilling into his soul the poison which he hoped would blacken it and change its hue for ever. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ty Hines In which a notable plan is discussed and determined on. It was a chill, damp, windy night when the Jew, buttoning his greatcoat tight round his shrivelled body, and pulling the collar up over his ears so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face, emerged from his den. He paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him, and having listened while the boys made all secure, and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible, slunk down the street as quickly as he could. The house to which Oliver had been conveyed was in the neighbourhood of Whitechapel. The Jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street, and, glancing suspiciously round, crossed the road and struck off in the direction of Spitalfields. The mud lay thick upon the stones, and a black mist hung over the streets. The rain fell sluggishly down, and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch. It seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the Jew to be abroad. As he glided stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways, the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile, engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved, crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal. He kept on his course through many winding and narrow ways until he reached Bethnal Green, then, turning suddenly off to the left, he soon became involved in a maze of the mean and dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter. The Jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed to be at all bewildered, either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way. He hurried through several alleys and streets, and at length turned into one, lighted only by a single lamp at the farther end. At the door of a house in this street he knocked. Having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened it, he walked upstairs. A dog growled as he touched the handle of a room door, and a man's voice demanded who was there. "'Only me, Bill, only me, my dear,' said the Jew, looking in. "'Bring your body in, then,' said Sykes. "'Lie down, you stupid brute. Don't you know the devil when he's got a great coat on?' Apparently the dog had been somewhat deceived by Mr. Fagin's outer garment, for as the Jew unbuttoned it and threw it over the back of a chair, he retired to the corner from which he had risen, wagging his tail as he went to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be. Well, said Sykes. Well, my dear, replied the Jew. Ah, Nancy. The latter recognition was uttered with just enough embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception, for Mr. Fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered in behalf of Oliver. All doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were speedily removed by the young lady's behaviour. 
She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin to draw up his, without saying more about it, for it was a cold night and no mistake. "'It is cold, Nancy, dear,' said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. "'It seems to go right through one,' added the old man, touching his side. "'It must be a piercer if it finds its way through your art, said Mr. Sykes. "'Give him something to drink, Nancy. Burn my body, make haste. It's enough to turn a man ill to see his lean old carcass shivering in that way, like a ugly ghost just rose from the grave.' Nancy quickly brought a bottle from a cupboard, in which there were many, which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, were filled with several kinds of liquids. Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, bade the Jew drink it off. "'Quite enough, quite, thank you, Bill,' replied the Jew, putting down the glass after just setting his lips to it. "'What, you're afraid of our getting the better of you, are you?' inquired Sykes, setting his eyes on the Jew. Ugh. With a hoarse grunt of contempt, Mr. Sykes seized the glass, and threw the remainder of its contents into the ashes, as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself, which he did at once. The Jew glanced round the room as his companion tossed down the second glassful, not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life-preserver that hung over the chimney-piece. "'There,' said Sykes, smacking his lips. "'Now I'm ready.' "'For business?' inquired the Jew. "'For business,' replied Sykes. "'So say what you got to say.' "'About the crib at Chertsey, Bill,' said the Jew, drawing his chair forward and speaking in a very low voice. "'Yeah? What about it?' inquired Sykes. "'Ah, you know what I mean, my dear,' said the Jew. "'He knows what I mean, Nancy, don't he?' "'No, he don't,' sneered Mr. Sykes. "'Or he won't, and that's the same thing. Speak out and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me in ints, as if you weren't the very first that thought about the robbery. What do you mean?' "'Hush, Bill, hush,' said the Jew, who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. "'Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us.' "'Let him hear,' said Sykes. "'I don't care.' But as Mr. Sykes did care on reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words, and grew calmer. "'There, there,' said the Jew, coaxingly. "'It was only my caution, nothing more. Now, my dear, about that crib at Chertsey. When is it to be done, Bill, eh? When is it to be done? Such plate, my dear, such plate!' said the Jew, rubbing his hands, and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. "'Not at all,' replied Sykes, coldly. "'Not to be done at all,' echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. "'Now, not at all,' rejoined Sykes. "'At least it can't be a put-up job as we expected.' "'Then it hasn't been properly gone about,' said the Jew, turning pale with anger. "'Don't tell me.' "'But I will tell you,' retorted Sykes. Who are you that's not to be told? I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants in line. Do you mean to tell me, Bill, said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, that neither of the two men in the house can be got over? Yeah, I do mean to tell you so, replied Sykes. The old lady has had them these twenty years, and if you were to give them five hundred pounds, they wouldn't be in it. Do you mean to say, my dear? remonstrated the Jew, that the women can't be got over. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes. "'Not by flash Toby Crackett,' said the Jew incredulously. "'Think what women are, Bill.' "'No, not even by flash Toby Crackett,' replied Sykes. "'He says he's worn sham whiskers and a canary waistcoat the whole blessed time he's been loitering down there, and it's all of no use.' "'He should have tried pistachios and a pair of military trousers, my dear.' said the Jew. So he did, rejoined Sykes, and they weren't no more use than the other plant. The Jew looked blank at this information. After ruminating for some minutes with his chin sunk on his breast, he raised his head and said with a deep sigh that if Flash Toby Crackett reported right, he feared the game was up. And yet, said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, 
"'It's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we had set our hearts upon it.' "'So it is,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Worse luck.' A long silence ensued, during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time. Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire, as if she had been deaf to all that passed. "'Fagin,' said Sykes, abruptly breaking the stillness that prevailed, "'is it worth fifty shiners extra if it's safely done from the outside?' "'Yes,' said the Jew, as suddenly rousing himself. "'Is it a bargain?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, my dear, yes.' rejoined the Jew, his eyes glistening, and every muscle in his face working with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. "'Then,' said Sykes, thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain, "'let it come off as soon as you like. Toby and me were over the garden wall the night before last, sounding the panels of the door and shutters. The crib's barred up like a jail at night, but there's one part we can crack safe and softly.' "'Which is that, Bill?' asked the Jew eagerly. "'Why,' whispered Sykes, "'as you cross the lawn—' Yes, said the Jew, bending his head forward, with his eyes almost starting out of it. Huh, said Sykes, stopping short, as the girl, scarcely moving her head, looked suddenly round and pointed for an instant to the Jew's face. Never mind which part it is. You can't do it without me, I know. But it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you. As you like, my dear, as you like, replied the Jew. Is there no help wanted but yours and Toby's? None replied Sykes, set the centre bit in a boy. The first we both got, and the second you must find us. A boy? exclaimed the Jew. Oh, then it's a panel, eh? Never mind what it is, replied Sykes. I want a boy, and he mustn't be a big un. Lord, said Mr. Sykes reflectively, if I'd only got that young boy of Ned the chimbley sweepers. He kept him small on purpose, and let him out by the job. But the father gets lagged, and then the juvenile delinquent society comes and takes the boy away from a trade where he's earning money, teaches him to read and write, and in time makes a apprentice of him. And so they go on, said Mr. Sykes, his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs. And so they go on, and if they've got money enough, which is a providence they haven't, we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the whole trade in a year or two. No more we should, acquiesced the Jew who had been considering during this speech and had only caught the last sentence. "'Bill!' "'What now?' inquired Sykes. The Jew nodded his head towards Nancy, who was still gazing at the fire, and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room. Sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently, as if he thought the precaution unnecessary, but complied nevertheless by requesting Miss Nancy to fetch him a jug of beer. "'You don't want any beer,' said Nancy, folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly. Oh, "'I'll tell you I do,' replied Sykes. "'Nonsense,' rejoined the girl coolly. "'Go on, Fagin. I know what he's going to say, Bill. He needn't mind me.' The Jew still hesitated. Sykes looked from one to the other in some surprise. "'Why, you don't mind the old girl, do you, Fagin?' he asked at length. "'You've known her long enough to trust her, or the devil's in it. She ain't one to blab, are you, Nancy?' "'I should think not,' replied the young lady, drawing her chair up to the table and putting her elbows upon it. "'Now, now, my dear, I know you're not,' said the Jew. "'But—' and again the old man paused. "'But what?' inquired Sykes. "'I didn't know whether she might perhaps be out of sorts, you know, my dear, as she was the other night,' replied the Jew. At this confession Miss Nancy burst into a loud laugh and swallowing a glass of brandy shook her head with an air of defiance, and burst into sundry exclamations of, "'Keep the game a-goin', never say die,' and the like. These seemed to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen, for the Jew nodded his head with a satisfied air, and resumed his seat, as did Mr. Sykes likewise. "'Now, Fagin,' said Nancy with a laugh, "'tell Bill at once about Oliver.' Ha! <laughs> you're a clever one, my dear, the sharpest girl I ever saw, said the Jew, patting her on the neck. It was about Oliver I was going to speak, sure enough. <laughs> what about him? demanded Sykes. He's the boy for you, my dear, replied the Jew in a hoarse whisper, laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully. He! exclaimed Sykes. Avon Bill, said Nancy, I would if I was in your place. He mayn't be so much up as any of the others, 
but that's not what you want, if it's only to open a door for you. Depend upon it, he's a safe one, Bill. I know he is, rejoined Fagin. He's been in good training these last few weeks, and it's time he began to work for his bread. Besides, the others are all too big. Well, he is just the size I want, said Mr. Sykes, ruminating. And we'll do everything you want, Bill, my dear, interposed the Jew. He can't help himself. That is, if you frighten him enough. Frighten him, echoed Sykes. It'll be no sham frighten him, mind you. If there's anything queer about him when we once get into the work, in for a penny, in for a pound. You won't see him alive again, Fagin. Think of that before you send him. Mark my words, said the robber, poising a crowbar which he had drawn from under the bedstead. I've thought of it all, said the Jew with energy. I've, I've had my eye upon him, my dears, close, close. Once let him feel that he is one of us. Once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief, and he's ours, ours for life. Oh, it couldn't have come about better. The old man crossed his arms upon his breast, and drawing his head and shoulders into a heap, literally hugged himself for joy. That was, said Sykes, yours you mean. Perhaps I do, my dear, said the Jew with a shrill chuckle. Mine, if you like, Bill. And what, said Sykes, scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend, what makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid, when you know there are fifty boys snoozing about common garden every night, as you might pick and choose from? Because they're of no use to me, my dear, replied the Jew with some confusion. Not worth the taking. Their looks convict them when they get into trouble, and I lose them all. With this boy properly managed, my dears, I could do what I couldn't with twenty of them. Besides, said the Jew, recovering his self-possession, he has us now if he could only give us leg bail again, and he must be in the same boat with us. Never mind how he came there. It's quite enough for my power over him that he was in a robbery. That's all I want. Now, how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way, which would be dangerous, and we should lose by it besides. When is it to be done? asked Nancy, stopping some turbulent exclamation on the part of Mr. Sykes, expressive of the disgust with which he received Fagin's affectation of humanity. Ah, to be sure, said the Jew. When is it to be done, Bill? I planned with Toby the night after to-morrow, rejoined Sykes in a surly voice, if he heard nothing from me to the contrary. Good, said the Jew. There's no moon. No, rejoined Sykes. It's all arranged about bringing off the swag, is it? asked the Jew. Sykes nodded. And about— Ah, oh, it's all planned, rejoined Sykes, interrupting him. Never mind particulars. You'd better bring the boy here to-morrow night. I shall get off the stone an hour after daybreak. Then you hold your tongue and keep the melting pot ready, and that's all you have to do. After some discussion, in which all three took an active part, it was decided that Nancy should repair to the Jews next evening when the night had set in, and bring Oliver away with her, Fagin craftily observing that if he evinced any disinclination to the task, he would be more willing to accompany the girl who had recently interfered in his behalf than anybody else. It was also solemnly arranged that poor Oliver should, for the purposes of the contemplated expedition, be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of Mr. William Sykes and further that the said Sykes should deal with them as he thought fit, and should not be held responsible by the Jew for any mischance or evil that might be necessary to visit him, it being understood that, to render the compact in this respect binding, any representations made by Mr. Sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated, in all important particulars, by the testimony of Flash Toby Crackett. These preliminaries adjusted, Mr. Sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate, and to flourish the crowbar in an alarming manner, yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song, mingled with wild execrations. At length, in a fit of professional enthusiasm, he insisted upon producing his box of house-breaking tools, which he had no sooner stumbled in with and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained, and the particular beauties of their construction, then he fell over the box upon the floor and went to sleep where he fell. "'Good night, Nancy,' said the Jew, muffling himself up as before. "'Good night.' Their eyes met, and the Jew scrutinized her narrowly. There was no flinching about the girl. She was as true and earnest in the matter as Toby Crackett himself could be. 
The Jew again bade her good-night, and bestowing a sly kick upon the prostrate form of Mr. Sykes while her back was turned, groped downstairs. "'Always the way,' muttered the Jew to himself as he turned homeward. "'The worst of these women is that a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling, and the best of them is that it never lasts. <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold!' Beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections, Mr. Fagan wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode, where the Dodger was sitting up impatiently awaiting his return. "'Is Oliver a bed? I want to speak to him,' was his first remark as they descended the stairs. "'Hours ago,' replied the Dodger, throwing open the door. "'Here he is.' The boy was lying fast asleep on a rude bed on the floor, so pale with anxiety and sadness, and the closeness of his prison that he looked like death. Not death as it shows in a shroud and coffin, but in the guise it wears when life has just departed, when a young and gentle spirit has but an instant fled to heaven, and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed. "'Not now,' said the Jew, turning softly away. "'Tomorrow! Tomorrow!' End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tige Hines. Wherein Oliver is delivered over to Mr. William Sykes. When Oliver awoke in the morning, he was a good deal surprised to find that a new pair of shoes with strong, thick soles had been placed at his bedside, and that his old shoes had been removed. At first he was pleased with the discovery, hoping that it might be the forerunner of his release. But such thoughts were quickly dispelled on his sitting down to breakfast along with the Jew, who told him, in a tone and manner which increased his alarm, that he was to be taken to the residence of Bill Sykes that night. "'To—to to stop there, sir?' asked Oliver anxiously. "'No, no, my dear, not to stop there,' replied the Jew. "'We wouldn't like to lose you. Don't be afraid, Oliver. You shall come back to us again. <laughs> we wouldn't be so cruel as to send you away, my dear. Oh, no, no. The old man, who was stooping over the fire toasting a piece of bread, looked round as he bantered Oliver thus, and chuckled as if to show that he knew he would still be very glad to get away if he could. I suppose, said the Jew, fixing his eyes on Oliver, you want to know what you're going to Bill's for, eh, my dear? Oliver coloured involuntarily, to find that the old thief had been reading his thoughts, but boldly said, yes, he did want to know. "'What do you think?' inquired Fagin, parrying the question. "'Indeed, I don't know, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Bah!' said the Jew, turning away with a disappointed countenance from a close perusal of the boy's face. "'Wait till Bill tells you, then.' The Jew seemed much vexed by Oliver's not expressing any greater curiosity on the subject. But the truth is that, although Oliver felt very anxious, he was too much confused by the earnest cunning of Fagin's looks and his own speculations to make any further inquiries just then. He had no other opportunity, for the Jew remained very surly and silent till night, when he prepared to go abroad. "'You may burn a candle,' said the Jew, putting one upon the table. "'And here's a book for you to read till they come to fetch you. Good night.' "'Good night,' replied Oliver, softly. The Jew walked to the door, looking over his shoulder at the boy as he went. Suddenly stopping, he called him by his name. Oliver looked up. The Jew, pointing to the candle, motioned him to light it. He did so, and as he placed the candlestick upon the table, saw that the Jew was gazing fixedly at him, with lowering and contracted brows, from the dark end of the room. "'Take heed, Oliver, take heed,' said the old man, shaking his right hand before him in a warning manner. "'He's a rough man.' and thinks nothing of blood when his own is up. Whatever falls out, say nothing, and do what he bids you, mind." Placing a strong emphasis on the last word, he suffered his features gradually to resolve themselves into a ghastly grin, and, nodding his head, left the room. Oliver leaned his head upon his hand when the old man disappeared, and pondered with a trembling heart on the words he had just heard. The more he thought of the Jew's admonition, the more he was at a loss to divine its real purpose and meaning. He could think of no bad object to be attained by sending him to Sykes, which would not be equally well answered by his remaining with Fagin, 
and after meditating a long time, concluded that he had been selected to perform some ordinary menial offices for the housebreaker until another boy, better suited for his purpose, could be engaged. He was too well accustomed to suffering, and had suffered too much where he was, to bewail the prospect of change very severely. He remained lost in thought for some minutes, and then, with a heavy sigh, snuffed the candle, and, taking up the book which the Jew had left with him, began to read. He turned over the leaves, carelessly at first, but lighting on a passage which attracted his attention, he soon became intent upon the volume. It was a history of the lives and trials of great criminals, and the pages were soiled and thumbed with use. Here he read of dreadful crimes that made the blood run cold, of secret murders that had been committed by the lonely wayside, of bodies hidden from the eye of man in deep pits and wells, which would not keep them down, deep as they were, but had yielded them up at last after many years, and so maddened the murderers with the sight, that in their horror they had confessed their guilt, and yelled for the gibbet to end their agony. Here, too, he read of men who, lying in their beds at dead of night, had been tempted, or so they said, and led on by their own bad thoughts, to such dreadful bloodshed as it made the flesh creep and the limbs quail to think of. The terrible descriptions were so real and vivid that the sallow pages seemed to turn red with gore, and the words upon them to be sounded in his ears as if they were whispered in hollow murmurs by the spirits of the dead. In a paroxysm of fear the boy closed the book and thrust it from him. Then, falling upon his knees, he prayed to heaven to spare him from such deeds, and rather to will that he should die at once than be reserved for crimes so fearful and appalling. By degrees he became more calm and besought, in a low, broken voice, that he might be rescued from his present dangers, and that if any aid were to be raised up for a poor outcast boy who had never known the love of friends or kindred, it might come to him now, when, desolate and deserted, he stood alone in the midst of wickedness and guilt. He had concluded his prayer, but still remained with his head buried in his hands, when a rustling noise aroused him. "'What's that?' he cried, starting up and catching sight of a figure standing by the door. "'Who's there?' "'Me, only me,' replied a tremulous voice. Oliver raised the candle above his head and looked towards the door. It was Nancy. "'Put down the light,' said the girl, turning away her head. "'It hurts my eyes.' Oliver saw that she was very pale, and gently inquired if she were ill. The girl threw herself into a chair with her back towards him, and wrung her hands, but made no reply. "'God forgive me,' she cried after a while. "'I never thought of this.' "'Has anything happened?' asked Oliver. "'Can I help you? I will if I can. I will indeed.' She rocked herself to and fro, caught her throat and uttering a gurgling sound, gasped for breath. "'Nancy!' cried Oliver. "'What is it?' The girl beat her hands upon her knees and her feet upon the ground, and suddenly stopping drew her shawl close round her and shivered with cold. Oliver stirred the fire. Drawing her chair close to it, she sat there for a little time without speaking, but at length she raised her head and looked round. "'I don't know what comes over me sometimes,' she said, affecting to busy herself in arranging her dress. "'It's this damp, dirty room, I think. Now, Nolly, dear, are you ready?' "'Am I to go with you?' asked Oliver. "'Yes, I have come from Bill,' replied the girl. "'You are to go with me.' "'What for?' asked Oliver, recoiling. "'What for?' echoed the girl, raising her eyes and averting them again the moment they encountered the boy's face. "'Oh, for no harm!' "'I don't believe it,' said Oliver, who had watched her closely. "'Have it your own way,' rejoined the girl, affecting to laugh. "'For no good, then.' Oliver could see that he had some power over the girl's better feelings, and for an instant thought of appealing to her compassion for his helpless state. But then the thought darted across his mind that it was barely eleven o'clock, and that many people were still in the streets, of whom surely some might be found to give credence to his tale. As the reflection occurred to him, he stepped forward, and said somewhat hastily that he was ready. Neither his brief consideration nor its purport was lost on his companion. She eyed him narrowly while he spoke, and cast upon him a look of intelligence, which sufficiently showed that she guessed what had been passing in his thoughts. "'Hush!' said the girl, stooping over him and pointing to the door as she looked cautiously round. "'You can't help yourself. I've tried hard for you, but all to no purpose. You are edged round and round. If you ever are to get loose from here, this is not the time." 
Struck by the energy of her manner, Oliver looked up in her face with great surprise. She seemed to speak the truth. Her countenance was white and agitated, and she trembled with very earnestness. "'I have saved you from being ill-used once, and I will again, and I do now,' continued the girl aloud, for those who would have fetched you if I had not would have been far more rough than me. I have promised for your being quiet and silent. If you are not, you will only do harm to yourself and to me too, and perhaps be my death. See here, I have borne all this for you already, as true as God sees me show it. She pointed hastily to some livid bruises on her neck and arms, and continued with great rapidity. Remember this, don't let me suffer more for you just now. If I could help you, I would, but I have not the power. They don't mean to harm you. Whatever they make you do is no fault of yours. Hush! Every word from you is a blow for me. Give me your hand. Make haste, your hand." She caught the hand which Oliver instinctively placed in hers, and blowing out the light drew him after her up the stairs. The door was opened quickly by someone shrouded in the darkness, and was closed quickly when they had passed out. A hackney cabriolet was in waiting. With the same vehemence with which she exhibited in addressing Oliver, the girl pulled him in with her, and drew the curtains close. The driver wanted no directions, but lashed his horse into full speed without the delay of an instant. The girl still held Oliver fast by the hand, and continued to pour into his ear the warnings and assurances she had already imparted. All was so quick and hurried that he had scarcely time to recollect where he was or how he came there, when the carriage stopped at the house to which the Jew's steps had been directed on the previous evening. For one brief moment Oliver cast a hurried glance along the empty street and a cry for help hung upon his lips. But the girl's voice was in his ear, beseeching him in such tones of agony to remember her, that he had not the heart to utter it. While he hesitated, the opportunity was gone, and he was already in the house, and the door was shut. "'This way,' said the girl, releasing her hold for the first time. "'Bill!' "'Hello,' replied Sykes, appearing at the head of the stairs with a candle. "'Oh, that's the time of day. Come on. This was a very strong expression of approbation, an uncommonly hearty welcome from a person of Mr. Sykes' temperament. Nancy, appearing much gratified thereby, saluted him cordially. "'Bull's eyes gone on with Tom,' observed Sykes, as he lighted them up. "'He'd have been in the way.' "'That's right,' rejoined Nancy. "'So, you've got the kid,' said Sykes, when they had all reached the room, closing the door as he spoke. "'Yes, here he is,' replied Nancy. "'Did he come quiet?' inquired Sykes. "'Like a lamb,' rejoined Nancy. Oh, "'I'm glad to hear it,' said Sykes, looking grimly at Oliver, for the sake of his young carcass, as will other ways have suffered for it. Come here, young one, and let me read you a lecture, which is as well got over at once.' Thus addressing his new pupil, Mr. Sykes pulled off Oliver's cap and threw it into a corner, and then, taking him by the shoulder, sat himself down by the table, and stood the boy in front of him. Now, first, do you know what this is? inquired Sykes, taking up a pocket pistol which lay on the table. Oliver replied in the affirmative. Well, then, look here, continued Sykes. This is powder, that there's a bullet, and this is a little bit of old hat for wadding. Oliver murmured his comprehension of the different bodies referred to, and Mr. Sykes proceeded to load the pistol with great nicety and deliberation. Now it's loaded, said Mr. Sykes when he had finished. "'Yes, I see it is, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Well,' said the robber, grasping Oliver's wrist, and putting the barrel so close to his temple that they touched, at which moment the boy could not repress a start. "'If you speak a word when you're out of doors with me, except when I speak to you, that loading will be in your head without notice. So, if you do make up your mind to speak without leave, say your prayers first. Having bestowed a scowl upon the object of his warning to increase its effect, Mr. Sykes continued, "'As near as I know there isn't anybody as will be asking very particular after you, if you was disposed of. So I needn't take this devil and all of trouble to explain matters to you, if it weren't for your own good. Do you hear me?' "'The short and the long of what you mean,' said Nancy, speaking very emphatically, and slightly frowning at Oliver, as if to bespeak his serious attention to her words, is that if you are crossed by him in this job you have on hand, you'll prevent his ever telling tales afterwards by shooting him through the head, and you'll take your chance for swinging for it, as you do for a great many other things in the way of business every month of your life. "'That's it,' observed Mr. Sykes approvingly. "'Women can always put things in fewest words, except when it's blowing up and then they lengthens it out. 
and now that he's thoroughly up to it let's have some supper and get a snooze before starting in pursuance of this request nancy quickly laid the cloth disappearing for a few minutes she presently returned with a pot of porter and a dish of sheep's heads which gave occasion to several pleasant witticisms on the part of mr sykes founded upon the singular coincidence of jemmy's being a cant name in common to them and also to an ingenious implement much used in his profession indeed the worthy gentleman stimulated perhaps by the immediate prospect of being on active service was in great spirits and good humour in proof whereof it may be here remarked that he humorously drank all the beer at a draught and did not utter on a rough calculation more than fourscore oaths during the whole progress of the meal supper being ended it may be easily conceived that oliver had no great appetite for it mr sykes disposed of a couple of glasses of spirits and water and threw himself on the bed ordering nancy with many imprecations in case of failure to call him at five precisely oliver stretched himself in his clothes by command of the same authority on a mattress upon the floor and the girl mending the fire sat before it in readiness to rouse them at the appointed time for a long time oliver lay awake thinking it not impossible that nancy might seek that opportunity of whispering some further advice but the girl sat brooding over the fire without moving save now and then to trim the light weary with watching and anxiety he at length fell asleep when he awoke the table was covered with tea-things and sykes was thrusting various articles into the pockets of his greatcoat which hung over the back of a chair nancy was busily engaged in preparing breakfast it was not yet daylight for the candle was still burning and it was quite dark outside a sharp rain too was beating against the window-panes and the sky looked black and cloudy now then growled sykes as oliver started up half past five look sharp or you'll get no breakfast for it's late as it is oliver was not long in making his toilet having taken some breakfast he replied to a surly inquiry from sykes by saying that he was quite ready nancy scarcely looking at the boy threw him a handkerchief to tie round his throat sykes gave him a large rough cape to button over his shoulders thus attired he gave his hand to the robber who merely pausing to show him with a menacing gesture that he had that same pistol in the side pocket of his greatcoat clasped it firmly in his and exchanging a farewell with nancy led him away oliver turned for an instant when they reached the door in the hope of meeting a look from the girl but she had resumed her old seat in front of the fire and sat perfectly motionless before it End of chapter twenty